Hello and welcome. Welcome one and all. I think I fixed all the problems. <laughs> I can't tell you 100% sure if it's true or not, but uh, I think I did. Can you hear the music in the background? Oh, issues earlier today. With the audio, because something reset everything. So hopefully you can hear me now. Let's get to the office, shall we? Welcome to the office hours, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Berserker01, Batman Chiller, your humble host and space bartender here at the Astro Pub, your space bar at the end of Twitch. Sit back, relax, enjoy the show. We got a good one for you. I will say it is very much a big news day, so we're going to be jumping right into stuff pretty quickly. Um, we'll be reading the monthly report. We'll be reading the letter to the chairman, which both be their own videos for standalone stuff. Uh, and we'll be watching the ISC. So, a lot of people don't seem to be interested in the ISC watching. So, we'll see if I do start to keep doing those. The last one only got like a hundred views. <laughs> so. How you doing, Voss? I'm running a little late because I wanted to, because I'm, I'm doing my taxes tomorrow, so I was doing last double check my finances. I'll tell you all my finances. You all want to know what, what kind of big money making operation the Astro Pub is? Noting that I don't pay myself anything. <laughs> you want to... Who wants to get a get? Take a guess. I'll say I made money. I made money this year. Okay. But anyone want to guess how much money I made after all of everything else? More than that, Apaches. It's not terrible, but remember, this is 12 months of profit. <laughs> this is profit after 12 months. Factory Fitty. I made approximately, and this is based off of all my calculations, I could be wrong or right, I have to show it to my wife and then I have to take it to the tax accountant, but I made approximately uh, $5,550. That's my profit for 2023, which is more than last year. Last year I made $2,000, so 30000 <laughs> Now, keep in mind, that's with me. I actually made a total of about like 22,000 something total, but I have to pay for an editor. I have to pay for a bunch of subscription services for software, uh, for marketing. Um, I had about a thousand dollars for travel. Plus I had to replace a bunch of computer parts. I had to replace this, this chair, the microphone, all sorts of other things that make, make this thing, this go. So the actual cost of running things is about $18,000. Luckily, it's not too bad. The um, because the the you know uh, because of how everything works out, this is not really a money maker for me. Uh, but my my wife uh, and I both work full time, and we we uh, we have the the maximum amount taken out because of this sort of thing. So we end up we usually end up with a with a little bit of return, not much. Like I think last year we had like a thousand dollars. It's, it does help because every so often, you know, we need the money for, you know, family stuff, which is where that 5,000 comes in. <laughs> Other bill off. Yeah. I mean, like the actual profit I had in terms of like the money left over at the end of the year was like a hundred bucks, but yeah. And it'll probably be uh, YouTube. That's YouTube and Twitch. <laughs> that's both. <laughs> Yes, I can. That's uh, it's a, in the U.S. You can reduce, you can write off a bunch of that stuff because of uh, business, um, business expenses. So it's effectively a hobby that pays for itself. So I can write off like video games that I play on games. So. He's got something. 
Yeah. Like, I can't complain. Uh, you know, I, I, I have a really good setup and it's because of people like you watching and participating in chat and donating and subscribing and all those sorts of things. Yeah, we do have a complete member system on YouTube plus Twitch subscription, so I'd love to see you come and do that, but... It's always a nerve-wracking time around tax season because I'm like, is this the year I'm going to have to pay? <laughs> is this the year I'm going to have to end up paying a lot more money? So the first person to go through the jump point was Mr. Trash, and I blame you for pushing for pushing for his recognition. Um, thank you, uh, Midnight Black SE, and I believe that Mr. Trash is an appropriate name for somebody who has traversed was the first first player to traverse the Stanton Hurston jump uh, the Stanton um, Pyro jump point because that's the perfect name for the space station outside of uh, the Pyro state the py Pyro. Uh, the Pyro Stanton Jump Point. Trash Station. And I already got the lore for you. It's named after the first person to discover the uh, the jump point from Pyro to Stanton after Stanton was already discovered. And it was a guy who, who's, who was, was an, uh, uh, an outlaw whose handle was was Trash. Was Mr. Trash. Who, who, who went through, run through the... Uh, uh, through the jump point, and uh, used it as a part. It sold it sold the location of the jump point as part of a deal with the UEE to to get get to get uh, get out of trouble. Hey, Big Floyd. Hey, Via Nocturne. And I will never, ever apologize for pushing for recognition and for, 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 like, um, organiz like, 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 for representation in, in, in game and for recognition of historical events in game. CIG said it was a big deal for them, so it definitely needs to be honored in game somehow. I tried. I got like 500 subs in less than a month, thanks to GT7, and then, well, uh, it stayed on that. And see, it starts as a bit of a, uh, not many want to see the content. I don't know. I wish... Warlock, welcome to my world. <laughs> Star Citizen has fits and starts. So, right now, I can tell you... Uh, uh, let me go over my, um... My, my, my st statistics. So, on YouTube, with this channel... I have 5,726 subs. Not bad, right? Pretty good. Uh, last month... I got... 201 subscribers, which was pretty good. January, I had 134. December 183, November 229, October 235, and then September 80, and August 95, and Ju July, which is the, the dead zone of Star Citizen 66. So I average, you know, not too bad, 150 subs per, per, uh, uh, per month, but between July and September, I just... <laughs> I just don't like it. Something from an Ivacati that no one none of said, but oh well. Um, the reason why I pushed for it was because CIG made a big deal about it. I wouldn't have said anything if CIG didn't go out and say this is a big deal for them. Um, and I know people are upset about it, and you can blame me for it. I will take that heat. Because uh, that's just who I am. Uh, I don't s post on Spectrum much. I don't say a lot, but uh, I like to use my pro my platform when I get a chance to, and I think it was a good use of the platform.
And just sort my ammo into stacks that nuke. Nah, you could do that for a while. It just. Eh. I don't, and, and to be clear, I'm not saying that the first person who flies through every jump point um, that already exists in lore should get to name it. It was just because this is the first player to jump between uh, between two systems and CIG was losing their mind about it. I said, this is a good, uh, this would be a good thing to kind of commemorate in, in the game a little bit. No, I know, I know you're not mad, but there were, there were some people who were legitimately peeved off that I was making the suggestion. It's like, hey, we're giving this Eva Kari special snowflake status. And it's like, no, man, it's just CIG wants to, uh, made a big deal about it. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a milestone. It's just like I put, uh, I, I'm glad that f um, both Damar Rally and the Jump Town Wars were uh, um, put into war the lore. If players do something absolutely fucking insane, I want it to be in lore. <laughs> hey, Major Maker. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, no. It's been in there for a while, but it's just been gl glitchy. So. Eh. I, I would say Star Citizen is a space sim in the same way that Wing Commander was a space sim. And I do think we need to stop calling Star Citizen a space sim. Because it's always been confusing and I think CIG just kind of didn't care for like about correcting people. And CIG stopped calling a space sim a long time ago um, because Star Citizen's evolved into like some thing. <laughs> it's completely different from its original concept. Not in the sense that it's a bad thing. It's just it, it because of the expansion of planets. It's sort of become more than just fly from point A to point B and do actions. I don't even call it half sim or half arcade. It's just what it is. Like it's Star Citizen is what it is. It's it's it was always going to have a little bit of a. Uh, It was always going to have a bit of a, 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 a like difference because it's going to have to. It had to. It had to adapt to the uh, to to like the, the nature of what what it is. It's a game, but it's a hybrid game. It really is. A, there's like no game around that's even trying to do what it that does. It's you know part arc, part arma, part battlefield, part. Uh, Tarkov part uh, Second Life part Euro Truck Sim, you know, uh, part I don't even know what else. Like, like it, it's a bunch of different. Yeah, it's got racing in it, so you know, part part racing games. It's just a lot of different things that are smashed together. It's either sim or it's not. Um, if we're going to use the word sim, then Star Citizen, uh, um, as as lightly as you hear it online, then Star Citizen is a sim. But if you're think if you're calling Star Citizen uh, DCS in space, it will never be. And Arma, sort of, but not really. The problem is, is that most people who would who, who look at the word sim. Imagine something that's super in depth and has intense complexity. Because you know, you look at look at look at um, something like uh, Power Washing Simulator. That's a sim, but no one would call it hardcore. So Star Citizen's a sim. It's just not a hardcore sim. The problem is, is that if you call it a sim, people will assume, oh, so it's this entirely complex thing that involves a bunch of different things and, and really tries to skew to realism. And the problem is that Star Citizen never did. 
from its inception skewed to realism. It's a dogfighting game. <laughs> dogfighting in space is not something that would ever happen, but, you know. Um, yeah, and it does simulate six degrees of freedom, and it does simulate gravity, and um, it will have aspects of repair and management and resource management and stuff like that. It's, it's a light sim. It's as sim as mech repair sim, you know. Coors Light Sim. <laughs> but the problem is, is you say sim, people will, you know, uh, say it's not fit. And then they'll start to completely scream about how it's an arcade because, especially early on in Star Citizen's uh, kind of history, arcade was bantied about as an insult. As if, like, Star Citizen is either DCS or it's Star Fox. And if it goes anywhere towards Star Fox, then it's all Star Fox and, you know, uh, it's terrible and awful. And with this discussion on Master Modes, um, it, it's, that's come back again with people shouting and screaming about it. There's gravity. I don't know. You go to, um, once you get caught in the gravity well, you go down. Each planet has its own unique gravity, and it may not be 100% accurate, but it is, it is also scaled, so. Yeah, but now you're talking about a hardcore sim. There's no games out there that are like that, except for uh, Kerbal Space Program. Like, El Elite doesn't have that sort of simulation. Yeah, but that's the fundamentals for any space simulation, anything about it. Then ha most of the games that are about that are called space sims aren't space sims. That's 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 the reason why I say when you use the term space sim, it's an old term. It's a term from the 90s. And it's uh, along the line of those um oh gosh, what were they called? Immersive sims. Like if you look at Deus Ex, right? The first Deus Ex game and realize that it was called an immersive sim, you'd probably screech because there's nothing about it that's sim. It's not a sim. <laughs> it's a shooter. It's an RPG shooter. But that's how the, the things were defined back then. It's like, um, oh gosh, what is it called? Like uh, Metro, me, um, Metroidvanias, you know? A lot of people don't know what Metroidvanias are or uh, roguelikes. Those are that's a that's a genre, but Rogue hasn't had a an entry for like a decade. It's not really a marketing labels. They're they're uh, they're just definitions. And as a historian, I can tell you, we put tags on shit that doesn't mean anything. Like, get, get a little closer, chat. Let's get closer. We invent most of the things. Actually, we invent everything. We have a name for. History, eras, they don't exist. Eras are lies. They're used as a classification so we can, you know, quick reference stuff faster. How about in science? The different uh, uh, categories for things like biology and chemistry, most of them are imprecise. Especially the stuff you learned in school. That shit's just way the fuck wrong. Unless you're like a engineer or a scientist, you know, today, you probably don't know the details of how absolutely insane everything is. Categories are inventions of human thought. They don't exist real in reality. We just like to put things in boxes because it makes our brains function better. Yeah. <laughs> we create, time exists, but we, the concept of time that we know of 
is an invention in our brains. <laughs> That's the reality. Is that like we have weird classifications in gaming because gaming is based off of concepts which don't exist anymore or are kind of weird. Like wait, wait until like the last, you know, wait until like, like the, my favorite is the uh, uh, Soulsborne. So Soulsborne is a fantastic description for games that are inspired by Dark Souls or Bloodborne. But there'll soon come a day when Dark Souls and Bloodborne are no longer being made. Like they like um, either the company that made them or um, the series themselves are put to put to bed. But we'll still have Soulsborne games. They'll still exist. I think, um, uh, uh, so Charnel says, I think the letter from the chairman was all right, but as usual, they're talking about something way too soon, not learning their lesson. One point I was going to be the road to Pyro all over again. I think it's important to note that what we're getting, what Chris is talking about in the letter from the chairman is not something in isolation. Other developers at CIG have talked about this. Chad McKenney and other people have have mentioned this. It's It's less of a, 1.0 is coming soon and more of uh we are reorganizing and readapting our strategies and our teams to build out for a future release. We are no longer building the basic building blocks of the game. As of when did they do that test? Last weekend? Basically everything in its basic form is done. It's in the game, it's in the the build. Now they have to build out the, the gameplay a little bit more. They have to manipulate the economy. They have to do the things that are actually part of the game. Not wait for some critical piece of tech, which is going to change the whole game. So what, what Chris is talking about, and I'll talk about this when we, we read through it. He's talking about a fundamental shift in how the development functions towards 1.0. I'll pull it up when he says uh, 1.0 as well. Well, we recognize there's no definitive finish line for non-MMO. We're always adding new features and content many, many years to come. Star, Point, Star Citizen 1.0 is what we consider features and content set to represent commercial release. This means that the game is welcoming new players, stable, polished with enough gameplay and content to engage players continuously. In other words, it's no longer alpha or early access. Much like we plan Squadron 42's drive to feature complete and the upcoming co uh, content complete status, we are significantly uh, we spend significant time looking at what Star Citizen 1.0 means and what it would take to get there. To facilitate this, I'm pleased to share that we're oh, we are very own. So basically, what he's saying is we're we're looking at what 1.0 is going to look like. What is Star Citizen release version going to look like? And uh, Richard continues on saying. Firstly, I'd like to thank the, uh, blah, 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 okay. With this new role, I'll be coming, because Richard Tyre is now the new head of the game. With this new role, I'll be coming on to board to help pub, uh, push Star Citizen to the next stage of its development, ultimately culminating in leaving early access and releasing to 1.0 version of the game. To the, um, to begin, uh, this begins with identifying the features that our content will require to fully uh, realize space MMO while laying the foundations for the future updates. This, to be 100% clear though, this doesn't mean going back to the drawing board, or totally changing the vision of Star Citizen currently is. With its aim, Chris and I have overseen the creation of, the road, of a roadmap that takes us all the way to 1.0 and outlines all the features and content we need. And this is crucially, so basically they're just talking about what, what, how that's going to work. That's the important part. New party screen. Jabelief just resubscribed for seven months. So when 1.0 fall? Uh, it's 1.0 is coming out on 
March 13th, 2024. <laughs> Jerry Bear, thanks so much for Prime. Prime sub for seven months. We're very important help. We're very impressive. Pennsylvania pedestrian. This is your fault. The reason we're drinking night. Shots and cheers and chat. Y'all shots and cheers. Stella Fortuna party. Yes. One of my favorite, uh, favorite, favorite lore pieces is Stella Fortuna. It's such a well thought out, uh, um, not that all of them aren't bad, are bad. It's like there, there's a, a couple that are just like, CIG really like, eh. <laughs> like you just, you just, just kind of like, yeah, and made, made it, made a holiday because you needed to just make a sale. But Stella Fortuna has a lot of really interesting background lore. It really is the, 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 um, the 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 holiday for luck and uh, exploration, so and I like that because it's cheesing off the whole luck of the Irish stuff, but it's also very much a uh, uh, kind of its own thing. Uh, let me see. Get either this. Uh, while well, these teams will be still instrumental in shifting Squadron 42, they will now uh, focus on bringing the existing features over to Star Citizen, as well as working on brand new features like base building crafting to help round out the 1.0 experience. Uh, working in tandem with Rich, I will continue to establish strategic vision to bring the life of intended Star Citizen gameplay experience. As Rich said, over the past few months, our teams have been busily planning for the upcoming major milestone in the Persistent Universe, culminating what we refer to as Star Citizen 1.0. As that roadmap comes together, it becomes validated. We look forward to sharing both you the vision and execution plan later this year. So what we're going to do is we're going to see that's what they're going to show off at CitizenCon. Is there their, their, what the, what they need to go from leaving Alpha to 1.0. 1, 1. Green Bear? Uh, no, his name was uh, Jer Bear Life. No one last, uh, so one last point I want to make is that, is that I can see this term space sim, which is defined by arcade games, Star Citizen would be one, or generally speaking about a sim as a simulation, DCS and KSP have options to reproduce scenarios that are reliable results with what we expect in reality um, for the time and age and what we can see every day in the internet. There is nothing uh, we can't, we can reproduce in Star Citizen that's relatable aside from visuals like seeing clouds and stuff like that. Uh, Malakina, take it up with um, take it up with how the culture works. The, the, the reality is is that Star Citizen is a light space sim. Calling Star Citizen an arcade game is uh, something to the equi equivalent of saying like it is uh, not in depth. Like Star Citizen is not an arcade game. It, it's not a casual player's game. It's not something you can pick up and and like. It's not Star Fox. <laughs> Star Citizen lives in a in a realm where it is too complex for the for an average person and too uh, in depth um, or, and and too light to be uh, a DCS. Hey, Mr. Gold uh, Gold Ember, thank you so much for that. Fifteen months of support. Paul, don't for, forget to get your green paint for your favorite ship. The one rule, one rule to rule them all. The greatest gunship in the universe. And you can't melt it. You can't transfer it. Aegis for Oh, uh, no. No, Mr. Gold Ember. It's a sci-fi game. I get why you understand the label is a bit off, but, like... That's just how it is, my man. <laughs> my, my, my fellow human. Star Citizen, in my opinion, was always going to be an extension of Wing Commander and Freelancer showing... That's the thing. It was. It was always pitched as that. And they said the best damn space sim ever. And I think the the, the it's C to CIG's fault that they pitched it as a space sim and players took it as, oh, DCS in space, and then CIG never corrected them because they didn't want the money to stop rolling in. But it's also CA Chris Roberts wants to add more elements of simulation, like like atmospheric pressure. So having things like life support in Star Citizen is going to be a thing. They're going to have things like uh, your that you have an aerodynamic uh, model where once you enter atmosphere, they want to have reentry heat be a thing. Uh, there, there's going to be stuff in Star Citizen which is 100% sim uh, adjacent or sim, sim themselves. Things like managing resources and power and heat and oxygen. Just because those aren't in the game yet doesn't mean that it's not a, uh, a sim.
Reentry heat at what's at which speeds? You're just looking for like KSP. Like that's that's a that's a not even space sim, that's a that's a like a rocket simulator. It's everything adjacent. Yeah. Having reentry heat um, and knowing CIG, though, when they do something like that, they're going to have some sort of uh, simu simulation elements as long as it's fun. So if, if players come in at slower speeds, they'll be able to not worry about the, the, the heat effects. Um, and at higher speeds, they'll have to deal with it in different deflection angles and that kind of stuff. But also you have a shield. <laughs> So you're fine. You may have to deal with like heat buildup, which means you have to gonna have to shunt some stuff. But that's the kind of thing CIG would like to do. They're gonna do it in a game of gamified way, where if you have something like a uh, an energy shield which protects you from the heat as you're coming in, that's great. But you're also going to have to shunt that heat off somehow, or it's going to overheat your ship. So you're gonna have to have some sort of cooling system to heat your uh, to lower your ship down and those sorts of things. That's something that's like a, a nice sort of gamification of heat management, since that's going to be a thing in the, in the game as well. And wear on the hull and stress in the shield and power and all that kind of stuff, yeah. But that's why CIG has stopped calling it a sip. And that's one of the reasons why I say Star Citizen is not a, not a space sim in the sense that what people are looking for. It's But it's not an arcade game. That's why CIG stopped calling it the best damn space sim ever, like five, six years ago. <laughs> they started calling it the like an immersive first person universe or whatever they've been calling it. So it's a light sim, a light light space sim or life sim, light life sim. Simulite, yeah. Ooh, Simulite. The early ones again, yes. It's a lot more complicated than Far Cry. <laughs> I don't think you're running around activating towers in Star Citizen. <laughs> I feel like you're going to hear arcade tossed around a lot this year. Yeah, and I, I think I think Star Citizen or CIG specifically is moving away from um, is trying to establish the game as being cinematic, an immersive cinematic experience rather than anything else. We run around activating towers for spreading democracy. That's different. <laughs> Uh, Flight of the Nova is looking like it would be an excellent space sim. Newtonian physics, including orbital mechanics. I'm uh, following that one close. There's been a couple of ships like that, uh, uh, games like that, which focus on more of the, the the nitty gritty of space travel. Things like how a fusion engine would work and f uh, other flight aspects, which are cool. But you could also look at the popularity of those games and see how niche that genre is. So many tier zero mechanics. Thinking about Star Citizen One Point is a lot to chew. Again, I think that the the main focus of it, um, I think the main focus of the it is more of C Chris trying to explain the direction that the game is taking or that the, the developers are taking, uh, which is different from what it was up to now. It's one of the reasons why he mentioned specifically Todd Pappy in here because a lot of people were making hay about. CIG firing people and CIG Chris basically just says like we need to move people away from LA because it's expensive 
Is it just me or does Star Citizen not have a clear design ethic where you can say things introduced in game clearly look like Star Citizen? Not the same way as many other sci-fi universes. I think to a degree, I thank you, Iris. I think to a degree, you're right, Kurt. Star Citizen doesn't have a, a complete aesthetic, but I would argue that Star Citizen, what it lacks in a unified aesthetic, it makes up for in, in individual aesthetics. Like, you can look at something like a hornet or uh, uh, a uh, uh, hurricane or an, an or an arrow and go, that's Anvil Aerospace. You know, a Connie, uh, an Aurora, uh, those sorts of things. That's RSI. Like, CIG focuses more on building a, like, a, an aesthetic of a specific system or a specific brand rather than a unified aesthetic for everything. And I think that's that kind of emphasizes their, their focus. CIG is not trying to build a buster. Thank you so much, Buster, for that raid. Welcome from the Buster stream. Buster, I, I'm, I'm actually thinking about uh, changing the theme back to ca character customization if you're available for, cap for Captain's Table this week. Because I do want to talk about it. You just got certified. <laughs> cool. I'll talk to Fastcard about it as well. I think that's definitely a, a, a topic I'd rather top, talk on. I love A1, and A1 basically said, bro, I got you if you need me to come in and talk about it. But I also, there's like four different podcasts who've, who've sat down and talked with um, various people about about like, about like master modes. I'm just like, I can't bring anything new to the conversation. I just don't think I'm going to be able to, and I just don't want to. Fucking Tomato's talking with Yogi himself or themselves. Like, I'm... Fuck it. <laughs> I'm not going to even try to try to, do, to add something to that because I'm not adding to the conversation. We just got a letter. We just got a letter. We just got a letter. It's from the chairman. Todd wasn't fired, though. He left because his family needed him to his position. Yeah, it, it's... Like a lot of stuff, it didn't seem like it was a malicious in any way. It was more of a, we need you to do this, and t he just couldn't move. And I was like, yep, yeah, that makes sense. It's, um, it's not the first time it's happened either. Uh, there's been a lot of people at um, various studios, uh, at Star Citizen, who've done that. So, Yeah, I haven't sat down and watched it. I'm gonna, I've got a... I got a bunch of uh, weapons <laughs> to paint up for my Tau since the Tau battle suits just, you know, got updated and the weapons that I have are not legal anymore. Luckily, I magnetized everything. So, um, so I'm going to sit down and paint those and I'll, I'm going to pull up that podcast and listen to it. It goes it. So, yeah, if you haven't checked it out, go check out. The, there's a podcast where Space Tomato sat down with Avenger One and Yogi to talk about Master Modes. Uh, Todd can always come back eventually. There have been a few that have left and come back. I've known people who worked at CIG who've left and come back. So, painting stream? Oh, I definitely. I mean, I'm definitely going to be doing a painting stream. So, since I've discovered how to do remote with this, with this, which is actually a really good 4K quality for 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 streaming with this, which is nice, um, I'm going to be start doing uh, over the sp over the summer specifically. I'm going to start doing uh, painting streams where like Monday mornings, afternoons, I'll be I'll be painting and uh, streaming while I do that. So Tomato got Yogi Clat and Avenger One on podcast, and the whole thing was basically Yogi talking A One down and gently explaining that no, we don't want to cater to just the Peter Meter. This isn't uh, this isn't complete. I have read the chambers later. No. 
Not, not on stream. I'm going to go get some water and then we're going to get that stuff there. So. <laughs> um, we're going to read that. I'm going to do a full capsule of me reading the entire letter and then the monthly report. Uh, and I probably am not going to do an ISC reaction to it because uh, to 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 the everything because we're going to be um, doing Captain's Table on it. So Yogi is an absolute G. Yogi is very very chill for what they do as for a living and what they what they put up with on a regular basis. Yogi is is like yeah fucking amazing. He's not your average bear. Uh, I picked up a full set of um, Ixionia Elite Armor on Microtech yesterday. I didn't realize the Dusters were on Microtech. I thought they were Hurston's original inhabitants. Am I wrong about the Dusters? Uh, we don't know. Uh, there's really no definitive evidence, um, but I almost, almost certainly the Dusters are the original inhabitants of the Stanton system. If they didn't retcon that out of existence. <laughs> I got you, Buster. I'll talk to you in, in Fast Cart. And I think that's a, that's going to be a good conversation because I think we're going to talk a lot about... Because CIG is really talking about representation. So we're going to talk a little bit about representation <laughs> in Cap State. We're going to ruffle some feathers. There's going to be a lot of mad comments <laughs> for that one. The whole Star Citizen is a PvE game that allows PvP is interesting to me and doesn't really solve the issue for me because uh, allowing PvP means PvP is relevant and will impact more than PvE players. It will, but the important thing to remember is that a PvP game is very, very, very important. Like, balance is very important in a PvP game. Hey, being able to balance everything appropriately and, and fairly so that players who use specific loadouts don't feel like they're overpowered than other, other ones like, that is key. That's the reason why most games that are PvE and PvP have different designs around them. Destiny, for instance, has a very different kind of appeal to both of them. And Star Citizen is never going to be balanced around PvP. Because Star Citizen doesn't work as a PvP game. It doesn't work as a balanced sort of combat game with, with uh, lots of other aspects. Because it's too broad of a game. Um... The, the way that they're going to balance a lot of this is that right now, players are the majority of the population, but when CIG gets all of their backends functioning properly and get everything's instituted, you're going to see a massive explosion of Star Citizen, or of a PV, PVE. There's going to be shit tons. Stanton is going to be absolutely fucking overflowing with, with NPCs. NPC ships, leaving, docking, coming and going, walking around in locations. They've already upped the number of P NPCs we've seen in recent patches. It's going to start getting fucking disgusting. Like, you know, everywhere you go, there's going to be an NPC there. And you'll be facing, if you fight, fight an NPC, you'll be facing odds of like five to one. If not, the CIG's own, own des designation of nine to one. So that's the kind of balance factor that comes into it, is that you're just not going to experience a lot of players in comparison. Let's get this out of the way. Oh my god, he's taking up so much of my time with capsule. I will, I will de devour your time. I'm going, to, I'm going to take your 30 seconds of your life that you can never get back. I'm going to savor it. I'm going to suckle it. And I'm going to, 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 uh, to, to mount it on my wall as my trophies. I will devour. Paul Shelley, de time devourer. <laughs> Again, I can't wait for implementing stability necessary to see it through. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, there's a lot of, it's one of those, like, wh why when I look at master modes, I'm kind of confused as to why they're implementing it. Because I'm like, but why? <laughs> Time troll.
PvP is necessary for the survival of any MMO, otherwise we'll have to rely on uh, on routine wipes. I disagree, Morgan. I think I think the more important thing for for um, managing uh, managing like economics, economic management in in video games, and this is a this is a hobby of mine. I like to study some of these. I, I love to go through articles when they come up uh, about these sorts of things. Um, the most important thing is that in economics, when we look at um, resources, the, in the concept of scarcity, the concept of scarcity is that we never have enough of what we want. Uh, we may have enough to satisfy our immediate needs, but we never have enough to satisfy everybody's wants. And scarcity drives a lot of conflict. It drives a lot of... There's a lot of complex things, but that's the kind of the, 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 the basic pillar of economics is economics is trying to circumvent and solve the problem of scarcity. And it's impossible to get away with it. We don't live in a post-scarcity uh, post society, and some things are post-scarcity, but there's other scarcity pops up because scarcity is fucking everywhere. Uh, and once I, once I learned that, once, once my eyes were open to this, it was like, holy shit, it is. Um, and the problem is, is that MMOs require scarcity to have an economy, but they don't have scarcity. So you need to implement a um, uh, a modified version of scarcity, a uh, manufactured scarcity, in order to ensure the economy doesn't have massive inflation. And most early MMOs didn't have that. And as a result, you had a problem with, you know, players being able to sell stuff. Astropub economics is endgame PvP. <laughs> Not really. Um, the way that you solve that problem, though, is you do the things that we actually have in real life, but you don't have to deal with in video games. And CIG, from the very onset of how they were developing Star Citizen, were building these into, the, into there. And one of them is probably one of the most infamous parts of Star Citizen, which is insurance. Insurance is what we call a money sink. It's a time sink, a money sink, both of which are important for scarcity. Because you want to have players' resources constantly be drained, not so much that it's not fun, but enough so that they can't hoard. And once you have that, that siphon started and you want to have bigger siphons for larger like hordes, effectively taxes, some sort of built-in tax system in the game, uh, that way you can siphon away the resources from players so they never have so much resources that they can just do what the fuck they want to. And that is, uh, to a degree, every game approaches that, that problem differently. Uh, Eve tells you to go fuck yourself. <laughs> they say, they, 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 they sit up there with their, uh, they sit up there with their, uh, their their cowboy hats and their American flag glasses up there in uh, fucking uh, Reykjavik, uh, Iceland, and go, capitalism is the end of all things. Fuck you. Money. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's a libertarian anarchist dream. Well, an an anarcho-capitalist dreams. Um... And Star Citizen is going for more of a... Uh, and, like, say something like WoW and other other kind of theme park MMOs are going for a much more managed approach. Star Citizen is going for kind of a balanced approach. If we're, if we're using economic systems as an exa uh, as kind of the parody or kind of comparison, Star Citizen or uh, traditional theme park MMOs would be more like socialism or communism in the sense that the central authority, the game developers control all of the means of production um, and and uh, or not means of production they, they control a lot of the, 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 the resources, how the resources are distributed and distribute it evenly to make sure players are happy but never too evenly so that everyone has too many things and one person has too many things um, Eve is capitalism in its purest form fuck you, get the resources, fight for them if you have to um, and Star Citizen's going for somewhere in between. It's much more of a, a kind of a, a hybrid economy, uh, a uh, what we call a mixed economy, what you typically call something like socialism um, or like uh, liberal socialism um, or uh, what is it called? Democratic socialism, I think. 
where the government has some control over the, um, the, the ebb and flow of money, but doesn't have too tight of a control. The CIG still wants players to be able to influence the economy, but they don't want the players to completely control everything in the economy. Something, yeah, something. <laughs> Effectively, what Star Citizen is doing is trying to match what is the most common fucking economic system on the goddamn planet into Star Citizen, which makes sense considering all of their lore inspirations. And that would work out. The difference is, is that in game, in, in, in reality, like most people's biggest expenses are going to be their like living expenses, things like uh, like housing and other stuff, where Star Citizen doesn't really have that. So what they're going to do is make you pay hangar fees and you have to buy food and drinks and they're going to manage that. I, I don't know what the political term is for it. It, it. Like in the basic, in Economics 101, we would call it a mixed economy. But the reason why we call it a mixed economy is because like the mixed economy is fucking anything you want it to be. Like if the government has any sort of regulation whatsoever uh, with alongside a, a market a market economy, then it's, it's fucking mixed economy. Because <laughs> it's a very generic term. Hey Paul, as a new player, it doesn't seem easy to, to earn a ton of money in Star Citizen. What, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a slow it's a it's a roll I should say, uh, Cantac, or like it's like a snowball. Once you start earning money, you can use that money to earn yourself more money, and you can make millions. If you play it regularly, you can make millions if you know the right the right the right schemes and the right routes and everything like that. But you have to do that kind of stuff. Uh, we have free healthcare in Star Citizen. We have free healthcare in Star Citizen now, but it won't be in the future. And that's another money sink. You're gonna have to pay for your regen costs and for your, your uh, you go and you have to pay for hospital fees. Or you can get um, medical insurance, which will pay a regular down payment and you recover all of your costs. But as you take more, as you start regening more, they're going to increase your costs over time. How do democracies interact with dictatorships? Uh, through uh, through anarchy. The rule of violence is a natural universal uh, natural universal language. Yeah, but CIG holds the has the holds the uh, monopoly on violence. They have the big stick, which is the UE Navy. So if they think things are getting a little out of hand, they can send in NPC ships, which are much more volume and much harder to kill than any players can, and they can manage and balance those things out that kind of chaos. Uh, I don't know, uh, Octavian, what are you in? Are you the same in? I don't know why you're not showing up here. I see you on YouTube or on uh, Twitch, not on YouTube though. I uh, know no, Star Citizen is 100% doing um, the American healthcare system. You're welcome, by the way. Welcome to hell. <laughs> Yeah, even if you own a medical ship, you'll have to buy medical supplies to restock your treatments. I don't know why see, uh, you're not banned or anything. Unless you have a different name you go by. <laughs> it's, it's, it's awful. As someone who lives in America with dealing with the health, American healthcare system, it's awful. <laughs> It's complicated. It's a pain in the ass. I went to go get new glasses, by the way. So I got. I went to go um, to an optometrist on Tuesday, and uh, optometrist is great, um, lovely person, lovely doctor. Uh, they took my insurance and they said it's not quite there yet. So I have to fill out a form and send it to my insurance company, and they may cover it. May. And I still had to spend like $300 just to go get my eyes checked. Luckily, I have, um, what is it called? A, a health savings account that I've been saving a lot of money in for the last couple of years. 
But that's because I'm lucky. <laughs> I couldn't imagine someone should do this. Francesco on there. Let me double check. You may have been caught in a coal or something. Do, 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 do. No, maybe refresh your, uh, I'm looking through the people who are, uh, who I've banned and that name isn't on my ban list, so. Take away my spaceship. You can take away my space suit. Shoot. You can even take away my space lasers. No PPUs. Oh, it is. But Hold you on. can never. I got you. Ever. Take you should be able to do it now. Game. It's because you're because you're uh, you have the. Background. And it's it's a well background. The first tasty just resubscribed for 35 months. Well, hello there. Hey, what's for up, first Lord. tasty? For the law. Thank you so much for the 35 months. You're very important, proper, very impressive, but you're very unique, best friend. This, this is your fault. You're drinking night. Shots and cheers and chat, y'all. Shots and cheers. I, I had that. I'm trying to get a CT scan on my shoulder for two years. Insurance finally agreed to pay for it and got it today. Yeah. Good night from Spain. Antonio, have a good night, my, my friend. Or, buenas noches. Me hablo un poco español, pero no es mi primera primera lengua. Se se vivendo en Barca, Barcelona. Cuando soy cuando un niño, un pequeño pequeño pub. My Spanish is rusty. It's been a while, and my grammar probably sucks ass, but... <laughs> I used to be fluent in it. Thank you, you know. I need to practice it more. My wife also speaks it. I live in Texas. I need to practice it more often. A lot of my, the best part is that I, I uh, because I, I, I don't tell my, my students that I speak Spanish. So um, I let them speak in Spanish because here's, here's the thing that happens a lot in the US. You'll have uh, like, uh, like people will start talking in Spanish because they think it's a language that, you know, people around them don't know. So especially if they think they're alone, they'll, they'll, they'll speak it very loudly. So my students will talk to me and they'll say something in, in English and then they'll start speaking in Spanish. And I, I take a note of what they're saying in Spanish. Usually it's the same thing, but just translated in Spanish. Like to say something in Spanish and then they translate it in English to talk to me about it. Um, but every so often it'll be like, motherfucker, fuck, I hate this teacher and uh, stuff like that. And uh, so I, I wait till about halfway through the semester and then they say something, and I and I go, I say, respond in Spanish, something to the, the point of like, that's not very nice. And then walk away. And then I, the looks on their faces, the panicked looks on their faces, and every time it fucking fills me with joy, because they go, oh my god, how long has he known Spanish? And usually that's well, you know Spanish. Like I've known it since I was a kid. I just don't talk about it. <laughs> You speak German, French, and English. I'm proud of uh, 
Uh, and I'm proud, even if German doesn't help for now. My uh, Latin teacher used to used to used to ask me to read uh, the Latin when I when when I was learning Latin because he was like, "You speak Spanish, right?" And I'm like, "Yeah." And I could pick up some of the some of the some of the words in Latin are similar to the words in Spanish, so it was, it was a little easier for me. And uh, uh, the way I was, I read it, I was reading like I would read Spanish. And he's like, "You have such a your your Spanish your your Latin is so uh, it's so fluid, it's so like easy." <laughs> You speak like your your uh, that Spanish that Spanish tinged Latin is great. I speak American. I also speak American. Goddamn, best goddamn country in the goddamn world. Tell you what, Woo! all right, I'm gonna get something to drink. Be right back. Um, that's why I'm glad I'm fluent in Icelandic. Pretty much, well, you had to Moriar because you, um, you, you worked, you worked with Ice, uh, Icelanders. All right, bear back. Also, Church Latin is an abomination. Stop it. Stop it. You're going to take away the fun button. The fun button's going away. Oh, I'm not peeking, right? I guess I am a little bit. Is that better? My immersion is ruined. Okay. I didn't actually take away the fun button. You just turn it off yourself. You stop doing it yourself. Now Divers 2 players will do, do the OJ someday. You watch. <laughs> Thank you, Dracon. I actually, I, I cut my hair and I shaved. Well, I shaved, I trimmed. So, right, nice and layered look going on. So I don't look like it's like a hobo. Did it for um, the... Um, uh, our citizen. All right, I'm taking away the, the fun button for now because we're going to be doing uh, a... Capsule. Okay.
Berserker 1 looking sharp. Yes. All right. So let's start off with a letter from the chairman. I think that's a good one. Then we'll watch ISC. And then we'll do the Squadron 32 monthly report at the end. Before I get started, before I get started, how is this capsule administered? Uh, uh, suppository. A slow suppository. I'm, I'm, before I even get started. Oh, I'm hitting the wrong button. That is not a Marcus Aurelius quote. Marcus Aurelius never said that and never would have said that. The father of Stoicism is definitely not going to shout what we do now echoes in eternity. That's a quote from Gladiator. That's a Gladiator quote. Might as well say strength and honor is the uh, is what the Romans like... Uh, like salute was or whatever, like they invented that on the spot. Fucking Chris. Well, at least you know he's a movie buff. Ugh. The Gladiator is a great movie. It's very, very good. But don't take your history quotes from Gladiator. <laughs> Start it up. Oh, hello there. Welcome to another Office Hours. Refreshing capsule. That's right. This is a small segment of the Office Hours live stream. As I said before, I'll say it again. I'm never going to stop doing it. So, but for those of you who are annoyed by that, there is usually a little cut between the beginning and the end of, um, of this. So you can actually like skip over this section and get straight to the intro. This is a small section of my Office Hours live stream I do on Thursdays at... It's at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific on twitch.tv slash the, the Astropub, youtube.com slash the Astropub Live. Love to have you join this chat here who's lying to you about it being pre-recorded. I guess technically it is recorded because you're watching this after the fact, but I did this live. Um, never trust chat. Uh, we're going to be looking at the letter from the chairman for today. But before we get to that, if you've been watching any of these in the past and you've been enjoying these stuff, and if you want to know more about the news, lore, and other stuff of Star Citizen, make sure you hit that like button, uh, subscribe for more content just like this, and hit the bell icon to be notified when these release. That being said, let's look at the letter from the chairman. Rare occurrence these days, released on March 14th, 2024. So, I had to point this out, put this out the chat. What we do now echoes in eternity, Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius never said that. The character Marcus Aurelius in Gladiator did, but that is a misattributed quote from a movie. Just like if you've watched Gladiator and they go around saying strength and honor, strength and honor, and do their little like salutes. Neither, none of those is historically correct. They just kind of made it up on the spot as like a nice little like 
thing, but it's been mis misattributed, so. Yeah. Marcus Aurelius. Fantastic person in history. Read, read Marcus Aurelius' stuff on Stoicism. If you're at all having struggles, and it's a great read to help out, because Marcus Aurelius was a Roman emperor who dealt with severe crippling depression <laughs> and lots of cases of like imposter syndrome and such. So his meditations, uh, which is basically his journal, his personal journal is great for, for, for if you want to kind of look into the mind of, of an ancient person. So Twenty twenty three marked the beginning of a transformation transformative chapter for Cloud Imperium and both of our games. With Alpha 318, our first release of 3.23, the team delivered persistent entity streaming, foundational tech that is necessary for server meshing SM. As we mentioned last year's last year, last the last letter, PES is the hardest part of the work needed for SM and uh, the, and is the one that required the most engineering. So overcoming the challenges with this release last year was mission critical. The launch of Alpha 318 was far more challenging than we anticipated, and we discovered some issues with our backend database that were only viable at visible at the scale we see at live release as opposed to Persistent Test Universe, PTU. Outside of this, we uncovered a lot of little issues that come from a truly persistent universe. While this, it is amazing to come across a wreck from a player combat a week ago, it's not so fun to try to land at a hangar where the last three ships crashed and left debris laying around, blocking your landing pad. We slowly worked through these issues and others, but it was a challenging time for both the development team and the community. These obstacles not only tested our skills and determination, but also demonstrated our resilience as we overcame them. Beyond PES, 2023 welcomed the long-awaited implementation of Salvage, encompassing hole stripping, structural component, and repair, accompanied by relevant missions. Traders reaped the benefits of an overhauled, no pun intended, and physicalized cargo system, while players across the board enjoyed many new missions spanning both PvE and PvP scenarios. I will pa pause for a moment and say Gcube does, does uh, uh, in chat mentioned that all of the books can be found free online. So go check them out if you if you if you're if that all if if my spiel at all uh, interested you in that. They're great to read. Our development journeys reached a, a series of significant milestones last year, all of which took center stage at Citizen 2953. The magnitude of this event for everyone at CIG cannot be overstated, especially considering it marked our first in-person CitizenCon in over four years. We have been powered by all of your excitement since the very beginning of this journey. Of the journey and we've missed the energy that comes from spending time together shared sharing our mutual excitement about what we're building the show was an incredible affirmation of our of all of our hard work both uh both on star citizen and squad 42 in 2023 and kicked off our best q4 ever in terms of player logins and engagement thanks to all of you a huge wave of in in q4 20 in, before, 2023 was the best year ever, with the record highs of daily active players, monthly active players, unique logins, and hours played for the year. More than 1.1 million of you set foot in the Persistent Universe in 2023. Now, it's important to note what, he, what he's saying there is that 1.1 million players were active in Star Citizen in 2023. I would like to know if that's active players, unique active players, or if that's 1.1 total active players. Because, you know, if you log off and you log back in, you count the game active twice, or whatever. I'm assuming what Chris is meaning in this situation is that it's 1.1 million players total play Star Citizen, including free to play, free, free flight, and, uh, you know, 1.1 million accounts, different accounts. So, interesting. Another major milestone in 2023 was welcoming, welcoming, um, welcoming the team at Turbulent fully into the CIG family. Our partners since the end of 2012, Turbulent has been responsible for large parts of our online infrastructure and have greatly contributed to our growth and success. This acquisition allows us to streamline our efforts and formally gives us a significant presence in Montreal, Canada, which is a hotbed of video game talent. As part of this acquisition, we gained two key senior executives, Benoit Beaujour, Bosséjour, Bosséjour. Please, chat, tell me how to pronounce that, and I will try to pronounce it better. 
the chief technical officer of Turbulent, who, bo who now becomes the CTO of Cloud Imperium and the head of our core technology group, CTG. You already know about Benoit from his presentations on their server messaging plans about other than the last two citizen cons. Benoit is a very pleasant fellow and very, very interesting uh, person to talk to. I've met them several times and I actually first met them at a GDC, which is really cool. Bosejir. 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 Bosejir? Okay. Jour like de jour. Okay. That was okay. <laughs> okay. Bosejour. Bosejour. Okay. Jour. It's like a zh. I know. It's a zh. <laughs> Uh, the second key executive to join ranks is Mark uh, Baudet, who is the CEO of Turbulent and becomes our senior vice president, studio op uh, operations, in charge of the operations and welfare of thousands of plus people, thousands of plus people working in Star Citizen and Squadron 42. Spread between our five uh, offices in Austin, Texas, Los Angeles, California, Austin, Texas, Los Angeles, Los Angeles California, Manchester, England, Frankfurt, Germany, now Montreal, Canada. Uh, I look back on 2023 with few months now to reflect and appreciate the hard work of the team around me. I can say that our experience in CitizenCon 2953 and the excitement from our community, both at the show and the game as they logged in Star Citizen in record numbers last year, left me feeling not only proud, but also deeply grateful and reinvigorated for the year ahead. Huh. I like that. <laughs> And what a year it's shaping up to be. On Squadron 42, that is taking the game from feature complete to content complete, ensuring the game has the necessary polish and feels worthy of being the spiritual successor to Wing Commander. To this end, the team is hard at work, heads down, driving towards the finish line. I am incredibly excited about how the game is shaping up, and we will have more to share with you at this year's CitizenCon, with, uh, which will be held in Manchester, England. There has been a theory of mine and many of the community that CIG will announce the official release date, of Squadron 42 at CitizenCon 2954. Uh, yeah, 2954. Um, which does seem to rack up because, and, and I do want to emphasize this for those who say, oh, CIG will just release it. That's a terrible idea uh, because what CIG wants to do is bring people who don't already know about Star Citizen into Star Citizen or into uh, Squad 42. People who don't already know about it. So they're going to need some sort of advertising blitz and some other tie-ins and so on and so forth, which I'm sure they will. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see. I think Manchester is going to be a very, very interesting year uh, for CitizenCon this year. So, On the Star Citizen front, the team's preparing to deliver server meshing and expanding the universe of Star Citizen to multiple star systems. One of the key milestones uh, of human achievement in the lore of Star Citizen is First Jump Day. Legendary humans, oh, Chris, you read my post. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, I'm the Astro Historian as well. And on, uh, on, on, oh gosh, what was it? On Spectrum, I posted that CIG should retcon the lore and make it so that first jump day was the day that, uh, I think March 9th, um, uh, of the because uh, it was April 10th and I said just move, move it a, a month back to March 9th but that's when the first citizen actually jumped to a new system and that CIG should recognize them and give them sort of some sort of um, in-game kind of nod to this event because CIG seems so, so happy about it so uh, I'm gonna take credit for this I don't know if I if, if I will or if, if, if it will matter or not but I'm gonna take credit for this I'm glad someone tell, told them about my silly idea <laughs> Uh, when legendary human astrophysicist and pilot Nick Croshaw discovered and navigated the first jump point, the mad lad he was, on 10th of April 2271 and became the first human to visit a planetary system beyond Seoul. Eventually, that system was named Croshaw in his honor. His journey was described as the jump that changed the course of humanity and led to the star-faring future we, de uh, we depict in Star Citizen and Squadron 42. He's a big, important figure. Uh, a lot of his quotes are used for explorer, explorers and stuff like that. He's the uh, less less horrible version of Christopher Columbus in the Star Citizen universe. Less less uh, less bad, uh, you know. The, the Marco Polo or the um, oh, what's the uh, 
I can't remember all of the different famous explorers. He's like the Neil Armstrong, is the best way of putting it. Uh, <clears throat> Eventually, that system was named, okay, uh, and led to the Star Citadel frame future depicted in Star Citizen 2042. You might wonder why I'm telling you this story. Well, a little ahead of this historic date, April of April 10th, we had our first Jump Day celebration on Star Citizen's Tech Preview Channel this weekend. For this test, our pro progress on server meshing and replication layer technology, we opened our first functioning jump gates and allowed players to test traveling between the two systems for the first time in our history. Players were able to travel between Stanton and Pyro via wormholes, with each system streaming in and out seam seamlessly. For those of you interested, our Versus own Nick Croshaw honor goes to an Evocati member called Mr. Trash. Perfect name. Perfect. No notes. For a jump point between Pyro and Stanton? Mwah. It, it was meant to be. Uh, who we believe is the first in the community to successfully jump. During the test, it was worth highlighting that we also achieved 350 concurrent players in a single shot, e.g. a replication layer with two connected servers, setting a new record for concurrent players in a single instance in, in Star Citizen. Now, here's an important thing to note. 350 players in a shard while there are two servers means that I believe, in theory, 350 people could be in Pyro or in Stanton meaning the max server limit is somewhere be above 350 people. Because you can only have as many people in a shard as you can have in a server. And obviously that number is going to go up as they work on server meshing and they get dynamic meshing working and all of those other things. But that's a pretty, pretty big deal. Where Star Citizen is turning into an actual MMO. Um, beyond the technical MMO that it is now because it has a certain number of limits. Which is pretty interesting. After many hard years of work towards the goal, many thought was impossible. We were on the ch jam that knife in and twist it, Chris. Uh, we are on the cusp of delivering one of the final pieces of technology that will be enable a connected, shared universe that thousands of people can experience together at the same time. I invited Benoit, who oversaw the historic test as our new CTO, to share a few thoughts about this monumental milestone he helped bring for, to fruition. Now, it's important to note that Benoit has been working on this tech off and on for five years now maybe more it's like half a decade it's, it's a lot of work as the new chief technical officer at cloud imperium i'm thrilled to join the cig family and lead our technology group we're dedicated to pushing the boundaries and i'm honored to represent and care for this team of pioneers and trailblazers one of my first initiatives as cto is establishing the technology preview channel it's a space where developers can fearlessly test larger tech, large technology changes with players way before they go live, fostering the spirit of open development with our community. Yes. Uh, in 2024, our server meshing journey is hitting its stride after years of dedication. We're closing in on our original vision we set to achieve. This journey started long ago with the introduction of streaming capabilities like uh, to Star Engine, like client-side object container streaming, Come on. Client-side object container streaming, you're calling it OCS? All right, all right, I'm gonna have to This is gonna sound crass, and it is, but it's C-O-C-S. It's Cox, because we have socks and we have Cox. Do with that what you will. CIG invented the, 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 the acronyms, not me. Uh, followed, okay, by server-side object container streaming, socks, <laughs> and progressing to purposes and entity streaming to maintain the entire game world. Every step has been building towards our goal to support MMO-level player populations and high-fidelity game environment of a large magnitude. Uh, we are gearing up to release the replication layer in 3.23. This is a big deal. It's the foundation we build on, the mesh on. As a player, you should perceive this specifically when dealing with server crashes, 30k, as those will no longer cause immediate disconnection, but gracefully, gracefully, <laughs> like a wounded duck, gracefully, <laughs> like a mad turkey, gracefully. <laughs> Uh, as graceful as a, as a pissed off bison. 
recovering, allowing you to continue to play. For developers, this milestone marks the true separation between the simulation and the replication, a homogenous achievement or a humongous achievement for the game and for Star Engine. But hey, we're not hitting pause there. We're charging full steam ahead towards launching our first multi-server mesh in 4.0. As gracefully as a drunk had a user urinal. Hey, at least at least the, the at least the, the 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 drunk manages to, to do the business. I think that's that's the best way of, of putting it for Star Citizen. Is at least it'll get done. It may not be pretty, but it's you're not going to have a 30k anymore. You'll just have weird universe-breaking simulation or uh, what, what do they call them? Glitches in the Matrix. <laughs> Uh, but hey, we're not hitting pause there. We're charging full steam ahead towards uh, launching our first multi-server mesh in 4.0. For this, multiple servers work together to simulate parts of the universe. As a player, this will enable you to visit Pyro through jump gates, where the jump gate tunnels transition seamlessly between game servers. Game shards will also host, host more players, so you should encounter more friends or foes along the way. This will mark the new beginning of our game architecture. In the coming weeks and months, get ready for more technical preview tests with various mess configurations, multiple game servers per solar system, and seamless transitions without gates. We're, ta uh, we're talking about layouts where serv servers are dedicated to entire planets and moons, others focus solely on landing zones or other key locations, with plenty of higher player count experiments. I'm genuinely, pr genuinely pl proud of this team. While we are facing challenges ahead, I'm filled with relentless optimism knowing that our amazing successes are waiting for us. 07. And while um, both sure, both sure, that's great, that's awesome. Uh, and I will say something that I've noticed is that CIG is an, it, there's a different tone, it's a different, there's a different vibe at CIG. I said at the, uh, at the very beginning of this year that CIG has a swagger, and it seems like that swagger is turning into a sprint, which is good. Uh, and uh, the one thing you want people like uh, Benoit and his team to be doing is playing, experimenting, and iterating quickly as possible. Uh, because the why that's important of doing the different configurations is because they're trying to find the sweet spot, the spot that they can do the most servers, the lowest amount of cost that can ha ha house the highest number of players. Because like I said at the very beginning, uh, when I was reading this, that the... They can only, their shards can only be as big as a, as many people can fit in a single end server kind of node. So CIG wants 10,000 people per shard, if not entire regions, you know, 10, 100,000, 200,000 people per shard. So if they're going to get those sorts of numbers, they're going to have to get 200,000 people per server. And they're going to need to have some wicked tech for some of that stuff <laughs> and that's what this is for this is them playing with those ideas at least for static meshing and then eventually going on to dynamic meshing after this as far as we know as we set sights in the year ahead the team remains focused and committed to ushering the community into uncharted territories with the release of pyro and star citizen alpha 4.0 I cannot stress how much this is an inflection point, as it will allow many more people to play together, but also allow to seamlessly travel different, to different star systems. All this points to 2024 being our biggest and best year yet in the universe of Star Citizen. But Star Citizen Alpha 4.0 is not our final destination, and with that, I have more exciting news to share. As we, re as we reveal that Citizen Gone, with Squadron 42 achieving feature complete status, complete milestone, we are now able to bring features developed from Squadron 42 to the Persistent Universe at an accelerated rate. As part of this, towards the end of last year, we decided to reorganize the Star Citizen and Squadron 42 teams to be more integrated to facilitate bringing several years worth of framework and polish into st to Star Citizen and finally set sail for Star Citizen's own finish line. So this is, uh, if you've noticed, and we'll talk about this when we look at the uh, Squadron 42 monthly report, it, what they've been doing is reorganizing the teams into strike teams. So individual teams which are integrated with a bunch of different experts working together to, to tackle a specific goal. Um, and I'm not too much of an expert in these sorts of strike team things, but I have heard people mention in the past that that's actually a very good thing to do if you're trying to tackle individual portions of like a, a project. Um, I'm not much of, I don't have a lot of experience in project management, so 
if you know of these strike team style of, you know, project management or whatever, whatever this, this is, uh, let me know in the comments below your own thoughts if this is a good idea or not. Oh yeah, I forgot. We were looking at 1.0 earlier. While we recognize that there is no definitive finish line in an online MMO, and that we will always be adding new features and content for many, many years to come, Star Citizen 1.0 is what we consider the features and content set to represent commercial release. This means the game is welcoming new players, stable and polished with enough gameplay and content to engage players continuously. In other words, no longer alpha or early access. So it's got to be repeatable gameplay loops, interesting. You got to be able to log in, a reason to log in every day. So. So this is their new focus. That's what Chris is saying in this. He's, Chris is saying that this is the new direction that they've reorganized the entire team to go towards. Much like we planned out Squadron 42's drive to feature complete, and the upcoming content complete status, we spent significant time looking at what Star Citizen 1.0 means and what it would take to get there. To facilitate this, I'm uh, pleased to share that our very own Rich Tyrer will be taking on the role as Senior Game Director, overseeing both the development of Squad Star Citizen and Squadron 42 alongside me. With this change, you'll start to see a more rapid expansion of features and content coming from Squadron 42 to Star Citizen, starting with Alpha 3.23. Which is, a sh which is shaping up to be one of our biggest releases to date in terms of new features getting into players' hands. Eh, not really new features. I would disagree with Chris on this one. It's more of polished and updated features, what we already have. Replacement of what we already had uh, of, of work in progress or placeholder features to the final version of what they want to be. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> Uh, okay, here's, a, here's someone's what's product manager here. I'm not entirely sure what the strike team would be composed of in CIG's case. Uh, what you'd want, though, is a self-sufficient teams with vertically in integrated skills. I believe that's what they're doing. Where you have QA, uh, game developer, like game designer, coders, uh, you know, physics folks, everyone who would be involved in this, like, just say, like, bounty hunting. Everyone who would be involved in making a bounty hunting gameplay loop together into one team to figure out what that bounty hunting is gonna look like um, much faster rather than having the designer write out a doc, send it to, you know, programmers who then, you know, write it up or whatever. Uh, such uh, that there is no need to throw a requirement over the fence to another team or have a sense of my part is done and X team, a team X now. Yeah, that's what I believe they're doing because they've talked about the different teams in terms of like they, they need, they've named them after their leaders, like Team Kane and Team, I don't know this guy's name, but yeah. Thank you, Gabriel. That way the team can uh, uh, own the entire requirement of any feature on, which should result in higher velocity. Thank you for explaining that. It's actually a, a good way of putting it. I believe that's what they're doing, but we have no confirmation. If there's any CIG developers who are watching this, please do confirm that in the comments below as well. I would love to hear that. Or if there's anyone watching live, I'd love to hear that as well. Any kind of clarification on this would be nice. Uh, all right, to facilitate this, I'm pleased to share that Richard Tyre are, uh, will be taking a new role as Senior Game Director, overseeing both development of Star Citizen Squad 42 alongside me. With this change, you'll start to see a lot more rapid expansion of features and content coming from Squadron 4 you to Star Citizen, starting with Alpha 3 at 23, which is shaping up to be one of our biggest releases to date in terms of new features getting into players' hands. When we announced it at CitizenCon, when we announced at CitizenCon that we would be springing across feature work, that had been developed and refined to push to feature complete for Squadron 42, we were not kidding. <laughs> yeah, Team Zuck. Yeah. As a potato farmer, I can confirm this is the way. Thank you, thank you, Luck. <laughs> you have spoken. Um, as game director in Squadron 42, Rich played a crucial role in helping steer Squadron 42 to its current feature complete status. Under his stewardship, the Squadron 42 experience has significantly surged in progress, a momentum we fully anticipate to continue to carry us towards content com content complete beta and release. Ooh. So that seems to indicate that CIG is planning for content release content complete to be done this year and then beta to start next year, which would done track of them being in beta for Squadron for about a year 
before it releases. That would track. But we'll see. That also means that we're seeing uh, Scott start Squad 42 in fall of 2025, which is a stupid idea, CIG, but, you know. Anyone, if, that's another story, we'll talk about it later, but it's, it's stupid to try to launch anything, any media at, at all alongside uh, GTA 5. Building Operations Supervisor for Amazon, uh, Gabriel, <laughs> um, hit the nail on the head. We have different internal names, but yeah, same idea. Okay. Oh, Building Operations Supervisor for Amazon. Gabriel hit, the, hit it on the head, same idea. Okay. I'd heard about it before, so. Firstly, I'd like to take this opportunity to say how great it is to be back working on Star Citizen. Some of you may know, you already know me, but I was in the core gameplay pillar director before I moved to become the game, game director at Squad 42 a few years back. With this new role, I will be coming on aboard to help push Star Citizen to the next stage of its development ultimately culminating in leaving early access and releasing the 1.0 version of the game. This begins with identifying what features and content are required to create a fully realized space MMO while laying the foundation for the future updates. To be clear, uh, to be hundred percent clear though, this doesn't mean that I'm going back to the drawing board and totally changing uh, the vision of what Star Citizen currently is. This aim, Chris and I have uh, overseen to this aim, well, or with this aim, okay. Chris and I have overseen the creation of a roadmap that takes us all the way to 1.0 and outlines all the features and content we need, just as cru uh, cru crucially the ones, and just as crucially the ones that will com come post full, uh, post full release. Okay, I've already seen people talking about, this is another road to pyro, uh, another roadmap. Let's not panic and <laughs> hit the panic button quite so far. This sort of thing is pretty common in any project management. You want to have a clear idea of what you need to do to accomplish your goal and the steps you want to take, which is harder to do when you're still building the, the your, your, your basic framework. Um, and a lot of what we've seen thus far and what Chris has talked about is the framework is done. Like a lot of the basic fundamental building blocks of Star Citizen are finished or in the process of being finished. So you want to have an idea of what a release version of Star Citizen is going to look like. Nobody knows. Chris doesn't know. Rich doesn't know. Nobody in Star Citizen community, in Star Citizen community, knows what 1.0 is going to look like because there's a lot of stuff on the way to making a game fun, usable, <laughs> interesting, uh, and playable. Those things are all going to be a completely different, it's going to be a crapshoot. You know, knows how that works. And that's one of the risks of game development is when you start developing a game, you may have no freaking idea what you're going to make because things change so frequently in game development because the idea you have may suck. It may be boring or it may be technically impossible, but you don't know about that until you start it out. So, um, with my role now overseeing both projects with Chris and the fact that Squad 42 has hit its feature complete milestone, it has provided an opportunity to reshuffle the teams. This should uh, this should see a large contingent of gameplay teams now coming back to focus on Star Citizen. We've also taken the opportunity to move away from heavily specialized teams like actor feature and vehicle team to more generic gameplay teams that should allow us to be a lot more flexible and shoulder some of the heavier burdens those teams used to carry. While these teams will still be instrumental to shipping Squad 42, they'll now be focused on bringing the existing features over to Star Citizen, as well as working on brand new features like base building and crafting to help round out the 1.0 experience. What I'd really like to know is what is that 1.0? What does CIG consider 1.0? And I'd love to know that before CitizenCon, because that's kind of a bad place to release it, in my opinion. Uh, they definitely need to kind of front load that and then show off those features as CitizenCon. That's a better PR strategy, I would say. Uh, with every release going forward, the intention is to move ourselves closer to that end goal, so you should expect to see large updates each quarter with many changes to systems that have not been touched in a long time, like economy, insurance, ins insurance, etc., alongside a whole suite of quality of life improvements with things like inventory, missions, mubby glass, etc., coupled with total, totally brand new features and content. We have ve set very ambitious goals for ourselves internally, both the game, game and technology teams, 
but Chris and I truly believe that they are achievable, and hopefully you can start to see that progress starting with 3.23 and beyond. Richard Tyre, Senior Game Director. CIG has always been aggressive in their goals. I think they've been too aggressive, and I still think they're too aggressive. But you don't get anywhere by being passive. So I, I wouldn't put a lot of stakes in 1.0 coming out this year or next year, maybe two, three years from now. And I expect it to be more like a beta soft launch than it would be a big bombastic launch. We're not going to get all 100 systems in three years or whatever. Um, we might get five. Um, but I also don't think that they're going to just stop development at that point, too. So it's going to be an interesting thing. And I think they need to talk with their marketing teams or build a marketing team. If they're starting to talk about 1.0 now, they need to start with looking at those sorts of things, getting brand managers up and running, um, looking at, uh, you know, they already do a pretty good job, but they need to get super in depth with this shit. Like, research it. <laughs> Because I can guarantee you that their CIG probably doesn't realize that they're staring at a very weird launch of 1.0 if they only have a handful of systems in and such, so. Yeah, people will be very upset if they find out their favorite feature is not a 1.0. So we need to know what CIG is shooting for before they, they, they do any kind of big hype because you don't want people to be disappointed at your biggest hyped event. <laughs> All right. Working in tandem, Rich and I will continue to establish a strategic vision to bring to life the intended Star Citizen gameplay experience. As Rich said, over the past few months, our teams have been fully, have been busily planning an up, uh, in upcoming major milestones for the Persistent Universe culminating what we refer to as Star Citizen 1.0. I think it's just branding. That's a bad branding. I would say Star Citizen launch rather than 1.0. That's a better, better, a better term because you recognize that it's releasing, but it's not done. 1.0 things like it's done, but Sage is not good at naming. <laughs> as Roadmap comes together and becomes validated, we look towards look forward to sharing with you both its vision and, exe uh, edu um, and executional plan later this year. It needs to be coming sooner. Uh, part of this development reorganization, we have made a, sig a few significant changes. From a personal standpoint, I have moved to Austin, Texas from Los Angeles to be closer to the time zone. Hi, Chris. Welcome back. It's hot as balls here right now. <laughs> it's about to be raining, too. Um, in the meantime, our main development operations in Manchester, Frankfurt, and Montreal. Um, I am a time zone to our main development yet. Uh, I'm spending significant time in our larger studio in Manchester with almost 600 staff. As I sit with Rich and the teams working towards com completion of Squadron Boy 2 and Star Citizen. As part of this, we um, we made it the, made the difficult decision to ask the Los Angeles development team, which had increasingly been uh, providing support for the main development teams based in Manchester, to relocate to join other teams, primarily in Manchester, but also in Austin and Montreal. Los Angeles, while shrinking, will be will still be an important um office for the company, but one focusing on business support, role with marketing, finance, legal, and HR. As part of this reorganization, we sadly waved goodbye to the Precision Universe Live Director, Todd Pappy, as he had moved back from to the U.S. from the U.K. last year for family reasons. And, and after much soul-searching, I determined that we cannot afford to have this role remote from the main team in Manchester for a good portion of the year. It is, sad, uh, it, is, it is a sad moment as Todd worked diligently for the last nine years in Star Citizen, making many important contributions and providing excellent leadership to, of his teams. I wish him the best of luck. I look forward to seeing what he does next. I do too. That's a good way. That's a classy way of talking about it. Um, but this isn't the first time something like this happened. It happened similarly with the previous Star Citizen Live development head. Um, uh, it happened twice. Uh, the first one, it just when movement, things moved around and costs and all those sorts of things. But, um, yeah, uh, CIG is very, very anti remote. Uh, they anything that can be in, in, in office is in office. Um, they do do hybrid workspace based on the people I know who've worked there and still work there. Um, but they are very much a hands on team. Uh, 
I will miss the sunny skies and beaches of Los Angeles, but Star Citizen Squad 42 take precedence. The journey is longer and more difficult than anticipated 11 and a half years ago, but the final destination is much more exciting and fulfilling. I would never have been, uh, never in my dreams have expected to have the opportunity to build something on the scale and ambition of Star Citizen, and because of this, I feel incredibly blessed by all of your support, and I am determined to finish strong. Uh, in a marathon, they say the last mile is the hardest, but the quote Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius, what we do now echoes in eternity. That's not Marcus Aurelius' quote, Chris. That's a movie quote. There are similar quotes you could have used. Um, uh, Lincoln has got plenty of great quotes about uh, about stuff like uh, uh, things. Or Churchill. You already stole Churchill's lines for, for your bishop speech. You know, there's plenty of those great, great lines. Or... Caesar, the die is cast, you know? <laughs> he didn't actually say that, or we don't know if he did or not, but, you know. I'm looking forward to uh, you getting your hands on Star Citizen Alpha 3.23 uh, soon, where we will, we will finally be able to experience many features we have been hard at work for the past couple of years, which will then lead into Invictus launch week in May. As a lead up to Invictus, we have prepared a series of missions to earn your UEE Civilian Defense Force Stripes and potentially earn an incredibly powerful, unprecedented in-game upgrade, the freaking F7CA, or F7CM, uh, F7C Mark II. Yeah. If you complete all of them, so you're ready to face Xeno Threat in a more personal manner. <laughs> more personal manner. Power of Community. Uh, the driving force behind our success is our extended team. Each and every one of you, together, we have built a community that not only plays a crucial role in our development, but also emboldens our shared passions for Star Citizen Universe. It is you who has propelled us forward. Without our passion, your willingness to test, and uh, to be undeterred by bugs and crashes, to be vocal with your thoughts, and stamina for the long, windy road, there would be no Star Citizen or CIG. You were there on the, for the iconic helmet flip and the opening of the hangar doors the first time in Alpha 0.8. Together, we explored the vast expanses of the Persistent Universe for the first time in Alpha 2.0, and you were on board for the in, inter, uh, inaugural planetary landing in Alpha 3.0. And soon, we will be leaving the Stanton system as we venture into the lawless wastelands of Pyro system in Alpha 4.0, thanks to server mashing. And beyond this, Star Citizen 1.0 twinkles on the horizon. The future has never been so bright. And I couldn't be happier taking this journey with all of you. Chris Roberts, founder and CEO. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there's not really a lot of insight here. A lot of this is reiterating and more focusedly, like they're very focused telling people what's going on with Star Citizen, um, which is a good thing for Chris to do because I know there's been a lot of rumors here and there, but it is very nice to uh, for them them to kind of talk about you know server meshing being tested and uh you know address todd pappy because that was a thing that was being bountied about by many um many media trying to smear star citizen because especially some of them are obsessed with it you know who you are uh and yeah it, it's it's a good feel good uh, I do have concerns about 1.0. I do think that CIG needs to address 1.0 before CitizenCon, just so we know the target that CIG is trying to hit. Because I think if you release that to our knowledge in like September, and then October said, by the way, here's what we have so far for 1.0, and delivered that to the rest of us, you know, during the event, I think a lot of people's fears would be assuaged by that sort of presentation. But you have to get ahead of that news, not announce it, and then like talk about it, because then it looks like you're covering it up. It's a lot better to lay it out, rip that Band-Aid off, because some people's favorite features aren't going to make it to 1.0, and a lot of people are going to be very mad that they, they want their money back because they didn't get they wanted this game for only that one thing, and now it's gone, and you're never going to get it, and the crying, crying and the screaming will be, will be pretty epic. But then if you show them step by step what's going on because Star Citizen's player base does not read. Um, they they watch videos, they listen to, to my dulcet tones reading stuff like this. 
um, because it's easier for them in their busy lives and they lack context without the visual cues. So it's important that CIG kind of addresses that ahead of time. That would be my only big thing. Other than that, looks good, looks solid. I'm looking forward to seeing how Star Citizen develops at, uh, beyond this 3.23 release and uh, see, oh, I'm looking forward to a lot of the, uh, how to put it, abandoned features of Star Citizen get their, their glow ups. So here's to hope. But as always, I want to hear your thoughts on any of this in the comments below. Uh, is this good? Is this bad? Are you upset about any of this? Are you excited about any of this? Let me know in the comments below. And of course, join us live at twitch.tv slash theastropub, youtube.com slash theastropub live. And I also want to thank HelloFresh for sponsoring this stream. HelloFresh is a service that sends you ingredients and directions on how to cook what, uh, and many, one of many different, um, different meals every month, every week. Uh, they send you the fresh ingredients and all, all you gotta do is put it together. Uh, and with my code, you can get 16 free meals. That's somewhere between 30 and $150 off your purchase with that code um, at checkout. So I'll have it in the, in the comments, top comments, and in the um, description below for those of you who are interested. Thank you again to HelloFresh. Thank you for watching. And like I say every time, hope to see you someday in the black. All right, back. Sorry, I wanted to let it, let let the music run out. So, what do you think, chat? It's a uh, less juicy of a of a monthly report, or monthly report of a letter a letter from the chairman we've had before. A little bit more emotional, um, but I do think it wraps up a lot of the concepts of what they're talking about pretty nicely. But stop misquoting Marcus fucking Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius has some fucking amazing quotes. <laughs> I must go. It's 2.30 a.m. and I begin at, uh, begin at 7.30 a.m. Have a good time. Thank you, Mateo, for, for hanging out. And helping me with my translations. <laughs> it's not really Kotaku. Kotaku wasn't really as bad as uh, Massively Overpowered. Massively Overpowered is... Massively has always had a... Sh like, been, been out for blood for Star Citizen. Like, they hate CIG. They have a personal vendetta against CIG. And I don't know why. Uh, I know originally it was because a lot of them were E fans and they really wanted to, wanted Star Citizen to fail so that they wouldn't steal E fans away from them. But I don't know. I don't know what the, what the fucking e, the, their, their their issue is with CIG. But. There are void birds going to make it for three out three. Uh, no, the boids the boids aren't going to make it into three out three. Yeah, they might. I don't think we'll see dogs or anything like that. But voids have been worked on a lot recently. So. Who? Massively OP. They're a, a kind of a minor, I would say a more minor um, media group. They're, they're not completely unknown, like they're quoted a lot, but they're not the big sort of media groups for that covers gaming. They're much more um, niche. Yeah, they mostly focus on MMO stuff. Yeah, a boys I could see as an a, a no, not announcement that. So, never heard of them. Yeah, they're they're like rock paper scissors shotgun. I listen to their podcast when their editor has straight up has straight up said CIG is bad. Yeah, they're, so. Yeah, their their editor is hates Star CIG like like, like vendetta against CIG. 
Now, to be fair, uh, the people I've known, I don't know a ton of people in the industry outside of CAG, but the people I do know who have never worked at CAG have told me in the past that CAG is very political in terms of a, um, in terms of office politics. Like there's a lot of bowing and scraping and a lot of uh, social capital you have to move to do anything at CIAG. And that's not something I have, I, dis I doubt. <laughs> CIG is very much a, you are either loyal to CIG or you can leave. Sort of that atmosphere. They've been like that since the very, since like the first couple of years when they had a bunch of people who were hired on and uh, did some questionable things on Spectrum and were leaking a bunch of information to the stuff and, and were like arguing and fighting with Chris. And so Chris and his team sat down and basically said, Fuck you, the, our culture is be loyal or get out, which can be grating. It can be difficult to work under if you're not that kind of, that this sort of person, so. But yeah, that was my friends of mine who worked at Riot and Bethesda said, said they, they knew people who worked at CIG and said they were having, like, they pulled me aside at one point when I was younger and saying, oh, maybe I should apply for this position at CIG and said, you have to be very careful with what they do, so. Massively hates CIG because their baby Camelot Unchained was a scam. Oh. Yeah, you believe or you need to go, there's only one captain of the ship. You're making, if you notice, whenever CIG talks about the game, they mention we're working on Chris's vision. They never talk about their own vision, they don't talk about the team's vision, it's Chris's vision. And they all repeat that. That's why Star Citizen gets that, that cult moniker. But it's more of a, this is just a, um, it's an, I would say an ego game, but it's definitely um, personality driven. There's creative conflict within opinions. Uh, and, and then there's blatantly arguing with the owner and the visionary. Base building soon. I think we're, we're the first version of base building will probably be at the beginning of next year, and it'll be a very basic version. Like you have the hand cart that lets you build a couple of them. But it's going to be a post 4.0 thing. I, I can't imagine it being a 4.0 thing. There's so much stuff they're adding with 4.0. I don't, I don't see how. Yeah, Star Citizen They used to be big time when Time Warner owned them, now they're independent now. Yeah, basically if you see anything, any kind of article uh, about Star Citizen and you see it's published by Massively OP, don't bother reading it. I don't even bother sharing it, it's going to be a hit piece. The new character customizer is going to be like a refreshing cruise dark hitting your space lips. Yep. Yep. All right. Speaking of which, let's roll directly into that. I'm not going to record this one because um, people don't seem to really watch my ISC stuff. So that's fine. I did it as an experiment and it initially worked okay. But I think a lot of people don't like that I'm kind of harsh on CHG with these. So I wouldn't be harsh on this one. I think we'll get a crappy version of base building by the end of the year because they, they did say everything that they showed this year, I believe. Uh, yeah, probably something like um, how we have uh, structural salvage. Let's watch this chat. One of the most anticipated aspects of the upcoming Alpha 323 has to be the persistent universe arrival of our new character customizer, <laughs> enabling better. Okay, okay. He's traumatized ornithologist. Your <laughs> customizer, enabling better representation and a true sense of ownership over your individual avatar in the verse. And to share with you the various ins and outs of what's ahead. By the way, this is actually an in lore thing. Calliope or Calliope. Project Calliope is a Biotic Corp, corp um, um, an endeavor 
which allows for outpatient um, reconstructive surgery. So you can have not just reconstructive surgery, you can have full blown like, like everything. You want to go from being a man to a woman, you go for it. You want to do you want to completely change your ethnicity, you go for it. Like it is it is in depth and how it functions. It's outpatient. It's CIG's uh, like in lore justification for um, for character creation. Like the character creator is an in lore asset. So. Ed, let's throw it now to just a few folks standing in front of the massive team. Uh, I should have watched it with me, Astro Pub, and I put it in front. I had to do taxes stuff, so. Your take is is very valuable because it's real, not lip service. And I I just don't know how to to market it properly in terms of uh, like YouTube videos. So this is not bad though. That made all of this possible. The reality of the old character creator is that the old character creator could walk so that this one could run. The original mandate was let's just get the PU customizer okay. working in Squadron. Yeah, it's supposed to be much louder. I'm, I'm going to try to, I'll turn it down a little bit, but. Turn it down to exactly what it is. There we go. Was building blocks instead of flash. It was very bare bones. We, we hadn't had a lot of progress on it. We had no design. We had no designer or anyone else working on the project except me. Basically, the, the catastrophe was make it look pretty. The very, very first uh, underpinnings of the character creator actually still exist. It's our DNA system. In the old one, you could only blend between the different faces. Also, you could only blend from one face to another at a time. The character customizer for Star Citizen is so important because players get ownership over their character. They're not just representing uh, some player character that some artist has created, but they're representing themselves. Uh, we want the player to be able to represent themselves in the world and the universe that is Star Citizen. I like this. I like the, the, the what they've been doing with that. That Biotic Corp, Calliope. So the character customizer that's coming into Star Citizen in 323 is broken down into four main sections. The first section of the character creator is the DNA system, and that's where the... CIG said at CitizenCon that there was going to be two body types. There's going to be um, just body type A, one and body type two, A and one, or A and B, or whatever. It's just two types. They're, they don't going to have names for them. Player actually interacts with the blending and the shape of the actual head itself. It's still the same DNA system in terms well, I mean, of when we apply it to the characters. The difference is how we interact with that uh, DNA system. It's going to piss off so many people. <laughs> There's going to be so many reactions of absolutely like upset, like like loud uh, upset people. It's going to draw so much attention to CIG. It's so much... Wow, so much free advertising. <laughs> so we've introduced face sculpting. Because <laughs> it's, it's more than that. Like you, anything you can do on one body type, you can do on another. You want to put a, you want to put a, a beard on the, the lean body type, you can do it. You want to put fuck tons of makeup on the, on the brawny type, you can do it. CIG has been very, very, very like, like upfront that they want to make it so that you can do anything with these, these things. This is the big, the big thing. So you can just grab these nodes on the face of the character that you have and shape it as you see fit. What face sculpting allows us to do is instead of saying, I want a certain proportion of a certain head, it allows us to say, I want to pull this vertex to this position. And then we can work out what proportions of different heads is required to get that vertex into that position. The system is very, very cool as behind the scenes, uh, we can't just uh, adjust the face into certain shapes and be happy with it. We have to also change the rig. We also have to change the It was like flesh morphing. It's kind of weird. Hey, Kenji, have a good night, man. Give me over bite. Corrective blend shapes. But we've also kept the original DNA blending as well, but we've tried to improve the user experience of that as much as possible. Now, I love you have a full that. list of heads at your disposal, so you can see all the heads available, and you can 
tweak, you can take a bit of the nose from that face, you can take the eyes from that face easily. It's quick to use. Yeah, so the PU is 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 very modern, sleek looking look. We, we, we're trying to go for like the almost like the Apple Vision Pro look. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it's, it's very modern compared to your squadron and it's, it's a lot more in date, I guess you could say. Basically trying to reduce the number of mouse clicks it takes to get what you're looking for. So some of the other things that you can do in the DNA section is the skin tone adjustment as well as the uh, skin material or, or the skin texture itself. So you notice that it says version 1.5.3. I can guarantee you that the Calliope bio reconstruction um, system that you have in Squadron is probably version 1.0 or something like that. Because it was very new technology when Squadron 42 is, when, where, where Squadron 42 is set. Like brand new. Like it just came out and it was only for the military. And then it recently has been released to everybody else along, alongside things like um, regeneration. So, Biota Corp is the people who also do the regeneration stuff. So, the regeneration gel, the goo. So what you can do within this is you can actually skin tone adjust this into realistic shades of certain skin tones to better represent yourself. Nice. Your freckles, and we have some blemishes on there. And these represent actual scans of people that we've done uh, throughout the course of the years, and we've actually scanned a whole bunch more that we will be adding to the pool as a time goes on. But we are always... Are we gonna get Super Mac finally? Super Mac and Detox? <laughs> no, it was, uh, it was Meyer and Super Mac had their head scanned. Making that pool larger, so the faces are always gonna look better and better and have more variations in them. So the next big aspect is hair. So within the hair section, there's a whole bunch of new hairstyles, which is obviously the first and most important thing. It's noodle. <laughs> That's fucking moist noodle. <laughs> He's even got the right color hair. Which is obviously the first and most important thing. One of the interesting things, and uh, the teams I represent uh, worked really, really hard on this to have some hair simulation onto it. Um, so you can see the hair move around as you're uh, even selecting it. And then as you add it onto the character, you can see it move around even more. But better than that, you now also have a massive library of beards and facial hair and eyebrows as well. So you can mix and match to get exactly what you're after. This, this feels like a system that like Bethesda would have developed based off of their modding community. Because like I don't if I remember correctly, the 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 Starfield system wasn't very in depth. It was very basic. It was like a basic but like evolution of what they've done before. This looks like what a modder would have done to like make Bethesda's game not look shit. Instead of what we had before, where you could cycle through hairs, you could cycle through hair colors. You now have a massive library of all the hairs. Whereas in the previous character, mutton chops. <laughs> the customizer, we just had a bunch of preset material variants. For the new character customizer, we want to give the player the power to go in and actually edit those materials. What's even cooler about this now is though we had the hair selections before, you could never tint it. You could never come up with your own color set. We can go in and we can change the natural color of the hair. We can change the dye amount. But we also have the new gradient system where you can choose to have one dye color for the roots of your hair, another dye color for the tips of your hair, and then you can set where the gradient changes. Not only do we have like a blonde hair, but then we have a... a, a... This needs to come in with the ship customization. I, CIG, please. Something like this for ship, ship colors would be phenomenal. I know they won't do it because they make so much money on ship coats, but like I said, I said many times, just use this, the, the skins as uh, patterns and then use these sort of things before. Purple highlight that. that hey, Ashbub, what's up? I'm curious. You play D&D? I do, actually. Uh, I'm a longtime player of D&D. I've played D&D since I was very, very young. That's done at the end or done at the top. And that's all player configurable. So not only do you have a whole bunch of different hairstyles to choose from, but you've got the full color gamut as well. Well, 
I'm curious, would a Star Wars Evil D&D campaign maybe interest you? Maybe, but scheduling would be a thing. Oh, yeah. Yes, I've done DMing. I've DM'd most of my life. I'm mostly a, a DM, DM, not, not usually a, a gay player, so. As well. And all of that is brand new functionality that we've added to a character customizer so we can update the shader params on the hair in real time. So my favorite aspect of the new... I'd have, I wouldn't be able to do that, Duncan, until, um, until like summer, because that's when I, I usually work on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays in that time. So. Facial hairstyles is the variety. We have a large library for being the first version of this, and it's going to grow even more within the Self coming years. Palettes, like and as we've begun things. to include more culturally diverse hairstyles in 323, the team is working on more that will be seen in the patches to come. So the third major aspect of the new character customizer is styling. The makeup is another completely new feature. Ooh. Oh, hmm. Don't um, don't build build it around me if you can find other people to do it. But I'd I'd be interested. But don't don't rely on me for to make it run. There's other members of the community who are also D and D players who would probably like to do that kind of stuff too. So just keep that in mind. For the new character customizer. You'll be able to pick your makeup for eyes, your cheeks, and your lips. We actually used to have makeup baked into the textures where uh, we had already pre-selected yeah, eyeliners and the uh, all and these kind of things nuts. to represent uh, what that given skin tone was. But we wanted the player to make that choice. We wanted the player to have access to all the different gamuts of colors, all the different specular reactions, all the different highlights that they may want to do for their character. For each of these, you will have some base versions that you can pick from, but you can also go in and tweak these on a deeper level. You can set the opacity, I don't, you can set that, different colors for, you can have one color for the eyeliner, one for the eyeshadow. Like the hair, we can set certain colors. That's baller. <laughs> That's fucking amazing. Colors and parameters on the makeup, so that's like how glossy it is and um, the opacity of the makeup. Unlike the hair, we actually set the shape of the makeup as well. And the way that we do that is we're basically adding new textures to the skin material on the players. And again, we update all of that in real time. And that is also quite similar to the new freckles and sunspots, how they work. That's again, another texture that we've added to the player character's skin. And then we can tweak these parameters on the shader in real time to show more or less freckles or more or less sunspots. So when it comes to the different styles and what you can achieve in the character customizer, it's been a constant push and pull of making it look really Damn good, it. really realistic, and letting Damn people Paul just Trump. do what they want. And we've been trying to keep it as realistic as possible, but still letting people do exactly what they want with it. Because we're leaving so much power in the hands of the players. They can tweak all these things. That finger's level with, cyber with Cyberpunk right there. Different colors and all of the Oh no, there's gonna be so many clowns. There's gonna be so many people with like just straight up clown makeup on. They're different on their hair, their facial hair, their eyebrows, as well as these different makeup sections. And it can get pretty zany. <laughs> <laughs> so the makeup itself is actually a fairly complex feature behind the hood. Uh, but in the end, I think it actually presents as a pretty fun interaction to uh, changing up the skin tone and again, representing yourself within the world of Star Citizen. So the fourth main feature is all the additional functionality. We'll have a review page where you can see your character. This is when you're actually taking a look at your character as a whole, from the toes all the way to the top of the head. Another part of the core functionality of this is the randomization. So now we allow players to both randomize the whole thing. So you get a totally new look, so you get a good canvas to start off of. Now, one of the really fun things about the character creator, and I didn't mention at CitizenCon, and definitely should have, is that we do have the save and load functionality hey. finally within the character creators. So you'll be able to export your character onto your PC and find that file, and send it to your friend, and they can import that into their game and see that character on their machine. Cute. So no longer will you have to worry about a reset, 
or anything. You can save your character. You can reload it. You can not only save your character. My wife's gonna be happy. This is all in Squad 42 too, and she has a like a three-tone haircut, so. ...character to persistence and get it to load into a PU, but you can save a bunch of characters that you can then just load in at any time into the character customizer, and you can also send these to other players that they can then load in your custom-made characters as well. And this is the exact same tool that we're using internally at CIG to create NPCs that we're rolling out to all players in 323. And I'd like to take this very rare opportunity to ask you guys and to challenge you guys <laughs> to make a version of Jared and share it with the community and with us so that we can see how close you've gotten. And if there's one I really like, maybe I'll do something pretty terrible with it. What I'm really hoping to see is a hyper-realistic Chris Perry that someone could send to me for reasons. <laughs> So that's what's coming in 323. But in the future, we'll also be adding tattoos, piercings, stubble, and more eye settings. So you're gonna be able to do even more customization at that point. So this is a major milestone for Star Citizen because- This doesn't look fucking real, y'all. Like, look at this face. This, again, I keep looking at this, I'm like, this is a face you'd see on like a modded 4K version of, of like a Bethesda game or like Witcher or something like that. This is like insane detail. <laughs> Finally, the presentation is exactly at a state that we wanted. So many different teams have been involved in this. I would say Uncanny Valley, yeah, but it's, it's very much where like, what they're shooting for. They're shooting for glam, glam uncanny. From lighting, to environments, to feature teams, to tech art, to tech animation, to animation programming. Everyone has seen this, has been involved in this, and it's gone all the way up through the chain, uh, through to executive approval. So it's finally to a state where Chris has actually been happy with it and that we could release it to the community. Really happy. We put a lot of time and effort into getting it to where we want it to be today, so it's come a long way. Particularly happy with like how, how it's just easy to use and you can basically go from like scratch and just completely start from a clean slate and just create whatever you want, really. You're going to be able to express yourself with your characters so much more than before. And you're going to be able to see everyone in the verse really being oh. themselves or whoever they want. CIG is opening Pandora's box with this, like 100%. They're going to be some absolute monsters. There's going to be some ugly motherfuckers in, in Star Citizen with this because people want to do it. Those are the people who will tweak it to be just perfect. That's great. Want to be out there. I think that we have made one of the strongest character customizers that's out there at this point. And they need to increase the animation density is what they need. There needs to be more idle animations, more movement, more facial geometry, stuff like that. So we are very proud of this. <clears throat> In the letter from the chairman, did you speculate on some of the items we are? It's the F7CM Mark II. It's the, it's the, or F7C Mark II. It's, it's what it is. So, what did we learn this week? Well, we learned that the character customizer in Alpha 323 is dopest. That it's the next major milestone in our continuing efforts to enable better representation and customization of your player avatars in the verse and that even more options, things like tattoos, scarrings, and even more are on their way after that. And of course, if you don't want to spend time creating your avatar, you can just hit the little randomize button down there and see what you get. Random, 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 random. It's crazy to know that all oh. these people work oh. for CIG. Hi, I'm David. I have to read the teleprompter. I'm the producer for ISC. I make it possible for Jared to do stupid things like this. And I'm British. That's it, just British. I say things like peanut butter, water, and rubbish. And I'm always explaining to others why Jared did things like this. And I'm good at my job, aw. But my job is being British. Teleprompter. <laughs> what the, what's that what's the line? What's that? <laughs> you like to have fun. <laughs> for Inside Star Citizen, I'm Jared Huckabee. Thanks for letting us share the process of game development with you, and we'll see you all here next week. It was awesome.
do it again. Oh, wait. All right, so um, we're recording? Yeah, we're all in. All right. So normally, at the end of the show here, we would have a meme image. It's funny. Ha ha. Um, David, do we have anything this week? Uh, we got our one thing, but we're not allowed to show it yet. Oh, the one thing we're not allowed to show yet. Um, well, I mean, who wants to live forever? I'll get out of here. There we go. Uh, this is a lot better. Can you, can, can, can you see this? No, no, this way, this way. What is this? Wow. Yeah. What sounds do the, what sounds do the birds make? Space birds. Space birds. Birds aren't real. They're... <laughs> They're a government plant, right? Pandarum. I get you. I get you. <laughs> Five years out. Hell no. This is coming out this year, baby. These are coming out this year. I guarantee it. If not this year, then like early next year. Like within, within, with between now and next March. See, I've just been working the fuck out of these things. <laughs> Clearly, never heard what a bird sounds like before in our lives. Oh. <laughs> Is that better? Is that what you wanted? <laughs> I would watch the Stella Fortuna tra uh, trailer, but it is 100% copyrighted audio. So, like, I could not, because that is definitely something that CIG purchased. Uh, but it is very good. It's actually, I would say, one of their better trailers. It's a little cringy here and there, but it's, 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 it's decent. It's pretty decent. Yeah, it's a, it's a scene from the Hitchcock, Hitchcock movie, Birds. Yeah, those are definitely pterodactyls. They're like pterodactyls mixed with, um, with, uh, pelicans. Which I like. <laughs> The Boyds. Attack of the Boyds. The Boyds. It's the Boyds, Jared. It's the Boyds. <laughs> Run from the Boyds. Yeah, we already did the letter from German. It will be up on its own video, though. Oh, I, I really hope. There's a few elements of Star Citizen in terms of Sim that I really want to make it, want, want CIG to make it in, and one of those is birds pooping on your ship. Gotta have that uh, full realism, baby. I get my Toby to sit right. They'll be up on video uh, tomorrow, so. I also wanted to steal food from you. I want you to be walking around Hurston, and then just a bird just comes flying and just jacks your 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 uh, your hot dogs from your 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 from your hand and just flies away with it. Like, Where did my hot dog go? You just see a bird flapping away with the hot dog in its claws. Fucking seagulls! God damn it! <laughs> A shoe bill, but shoe bills don't have leathery wings. <laughs> Should have stole my chip. <laughs> oh, bird strikes. Oh, God. We're going to have bird strikes in Star Citizen. <laughs> God damn it. We're going to have that, aren't we? I can't wait for the first player to have a bird strike. They fly into a bird, not seeing it, just goes <laughs> into the windshield and just will bounce off and cause massive damage to the ship. <laughs> There's space birds. 
almost certainly, just, just so you all know, uh, uh, the way that the lore works in Star Citizen is there are lots of like plants and animals that are seed animals. And a couple of them are from Earth, but a lot of them are from other planets like Terra and um, there may be other ones in like uh, like Lear and such that, are, that have been harvested for it. But they, um, as a result, almost every planet is going to have some version of certain animals like the Kazi Grazer, which is the space cow. Uh, or the blind oni crab, which is the, um, the it's like a it's like a floating rat that's filled with shit. It's filled. It's a it's a rat that's it's a mini Hindenburg because it floats around on, with hydrogen and poops it poops out hydrogen and move around. Um, yeah. Did I miss the picture? Yeah, let me see it. Oh, that's the, I was wondering what that was. That is a hundred percent. I didn't even notice that. That's clever, CIG. That's clever. I was wondering why they were so still. It was like kind of weird. I'm like, I was waiting for them to do that, honestly. I was waiting for them to recreate, create that image with Jump Town. That's perfect. Mwah. Hats off to you, CIG. Hats off to you. So, Fire, let me explain to you. Do you remember people talking about the Willy Wonka experience? I'm sorry, the the the, the cho Willy Chocolatier experience in Glasgow, Scotland. It was all over the internet a, a few, few weeks ago. That's an image, the top image there. I'll pull it up again. The top image is from that event. That was one of the Oompa Loompas. And so what they did was recreated that event with the character creator. The Oompa Loompa, yeah. The woman who's like a children's yoga coach or whatever. This image, this meme went around everywhere. And everyone kind of like riffed on it. I was waiting for CIG to riff on it and they did. That's mwah, mwah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tweet that out. I'm sure it's already been tweeted out, but thank you for, for showing that to me. Oh, it's so bad. It's so bad. It's, it's a textbook, a textbook example of why you don't use uh, AI to make anything because it just ends up being terrible. She was great. There's, there's some other good good images of her uh, trying to make the most of it with dealing with the kids because she's she's a children's entertainer. She knows how to deal with the kids. So, historian's kiss. Mwah. Yes. Um. There's there's a couple of people who've done dramatic readings of the whole thing because the script leaked online. It was great. She didn't even get paid, which sucks. Like, none of the actors got paid for it. They got hosed. Yes. <laughs> we 
need to go over the letter from the chairman. Hold on. Sneezing up a storm. Yeah, we already read. I read over letter from the chairman, and I'm uh, gonna post the whole thing online rather than this like kind of um, summary thing that a lot of people do. It's fifty bucks per person. It was nuts. All right, I'm gonna get some water. Then I'm gonna read the monthly report for Squadron Forty Two, um, and then probably call it a night because we've been going. We're coming up on uh, four hours, and I want to try to get some sleep. Because I gotta go to get at like eleven a.m. I've gotta get. Um, I'm going to do my taxes. So I print some stuff off and. Yeah, it's going to be posted tomorrow. I'll have it up tomorrow, like, at noon. I see a lot of people posting, like, their summaries of it, which is fine. But full read-through, I think, is an important context. So. Oh, I'm not, st I'm not stopping the stream right now. I've still got, we still got an hour and a half. I'm a little sad that, uh, I'm looking at my, uh, my latest lore video and it's not doing well. <laughs> it's not doing well at all. Uh, it was on, it was on, uh, Terminids and stuff like that, but. For, for, so, I, so I'm probably gonna put the halt on Helldivers 2. It's too, it, the, 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 the competition is too high and it's not like, it, you're, you're, I'm just getting crushed by the number of people who are doing it. Which is nice, I'm glad that the game's doing well, but there's no way I'm doing, uh. There's no way I'm going to be able to, like, grow with it, unfortunately. Thank you, Chaos. Well, I just, the problem is that there's not a lot of crossover between Star Citizen fans and, uh, um, and Helldivers. So, uh, I, I might go back and do this, the, the, the automatons when the hype dies down a little bit, but. All right, I'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Uh, it's it's an official Super Earth uh, re release there, Minstrel. It's it's the very beginning. Good news, but everyone. you have to watch it. If you don't watch it, you will be uh, you will be brought up on charges from your democracy officer. So you're threatening, you're risking your own life and career right now, Minstrel. Be right back. Everybody and his dog calls himself an outlaw. I love democracy. Freedom! Freedom! It's a democracy! I'm just an old fashioned Are cowboy. I'm pilot. Two words. Distress. 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 Distress, 
I'm Fly, I'm Pilot. Fun button. Not the <sighs> Not the you broke it to democracy. Is it not working? Good news, everyone. This is going through. Turning it off anyways. All right, chat. Let's prepare for the Squadron 42 month report. I do know that I am the only person who does Squadron 42 month report. Nobody else bothers to do this kind of stuff. It's very short too, so it's not too bad. I mean, I, I said it in my video on um, uh, that I just recorded on uh, for the, the monthly report was like Star Citizen community doesn't read. And it's not meant as like a like an insult. It, I mean, to a degree, it is. Please read more. Um, but it, they rely on me, visual media to be able to talk because the message is the medium. <laughs> like your 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 like the point of Star Citizen is always be, is and will always be um, a video game, and people don't read video games. They don't listen to video games. They watch them. So, I mean, to a degree you can listen, but <laughs> people are much more interested in <clears throat> watching stuff about Star Citizen than they are, and listening to it, than they are about reading it. Because they just don't have time. Uh, New Soul, I don't know if I did or not. I don't think I did.
Those kids would be real mad if they could read, yeah. Okay. What are all famous? Uh, the ISC, the uh, letter from the chairman, we're, go we're going on to the squad before the human to report though, so. Well, in their defense, the reports do read like corporate reports, hardly entertainment. They're not really entertainment, no. But the reality is, is that, um, as I as I always like to say, is like if you are a Star Citizen fan and you're interested in, uh, if you're interested in following Star Citizen's, uh, uh development, then you should probably read the reports. There's plenty of people who get super fucking butthurt and mad about certain aspects of the game. And it's like, did you read the reports? <laughs> They're in the reports. But well, I don't trust the reports. It's obvious they don't read because they don't want to or they, they want to just be mad. And that's what always drives me crazy is people who claim to be very learned or very like like in touch with the game and have crit critical opinions about the game obviously don't follow the game. Like they just get mad at things that they want to get mad at. And that's what, why when I say please read read the reports, I mean like read the fucking reports. If you want to follow the, the development of the game, then you have to read it. What reports? Uh, so CIG releases monthly reports every month going over kind of a summary of everything they've been working on. Uh, combine that with, say, the roadmap updates and when they get a chance to, the <laughs> the progress report trackers and the ISCs, you can get a very good picture of what CIG is working on at any given time. Um, and it can really help you really understand the, 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 the direction of development sometimes months ahead of time before CIG ever mentions it in an ISC. Some reports are kind of vague, though. A lot of them are, are kind of vague. But again, like, it's it's not easy, but it's true. You gotta you have to read because that's how CIG talks to, to its community. You were joking? I, I didn't know because I didn't know if you were, you were newer or not because uh, I don't know. Yeah, they, the monthly report could be a 10-minute video from CIG. I, I have said in the past that CIG could just have an audiobook format where Jared reads the uh, the monthly report, um, the, you know, for 20, 30 minutes and then puts it up as an audio file. The words aren't necessarily, they make no sense. A lot of the words are just technical. Need someone British for the audio the monthly, the monthly audio book. I mean, to a degree, I'm glad they don't because it's the one thing that I do that people watch. So,
I don't think you're gonna have Morgan Freeman. What they should do is just hire, um, hire Space Tomato to read it. Just have Space Tomato do, uh, put together monthly reports uh, with some 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 footage. Pay Space Tomato with his dulcet voice. All right. We got this. We got this chat. Hey, Dad Bob Nerd. We're going to get into Squash 42 monthly report. You ready, chat? Are you ready? Your fun button is taken away. <laughs> Here goes nothing. Hello and welcome to another Office Hours. Crisp and refreshing capsule. This is a little small segment of my Office Hours live stream that I uh, talk a little bit about um, set aside to do like a video content for y'all. You know how to put it. My brain just four foot right there. Four foot right there. Um, set aside. Give you a little se segment of the longer context and longer conversation. But I'd love to have you join us live at twitchtv theastropub youtubecom theastropub live. Uh, Saturday or no Thursdays at eight p.m. Eastern, five p.m. Pacific. Of you have to come on and join chat and talk a bit about. All the events, the news, lore, and more of Star Citizen. Without, the, without all being said, today we're going to cover another monthly report, this time from Squadron 42. Specifically, the February 2024 Squadron 42 monthly report. Now, as always, when I read these monthly reports, it's important to uh, know that I am not summarizing these. I am reading it verbatim. Because I think it's important that if you want to understand the development of any project, you need to read the topics and the things that they release. And in this case, CIG puts a lot of work and effort into releasing these summaries of their own reports that summarizing the summary doesn't really help. So learning about everything and all this context can help you better understand how both Squad 42 and Star Citizen is going. And on top of that, I'll give you a little bit of context about previous months about what they've talked about as well. Without any further ado, let's start with Squad 42 monthly report from February of 2024. AI content. AI content continued to make key enhancements and refinements with the Idris Stanton receiving focus in February. Idris Stanton is the Stanton, uh, is the name of the ship that you're on. Uh, it's an Idris class frigate, so. For example, dynamic conversations were fine-tuned with updates to NPC standing positions and additional randomizations to provide a more authentic feel. Updates were also made to the gym, including punching uh, punch bags that now align perfectly and animate smoothly. Is that a Britishism? You can call them punching bags, you call them punch bags? I don't know. Let me know in the comments. We also reworked gym hours to be more balanced so players will see the correct number of NPCs whenever they choose to visit. Plans for busier times were created to ensure NPCs can always find a place to work out. This has been part of a, a lot of the larger sort of social drive that the AI content team's been doing for Star Citizen and Squadron 42. They've been really trying to flesh out that sort of social aspect of the game. Turn the volume just a little bit. There we go. Additional animations were added to the bridge, including hands-on ears to demonstrate cross-ship communication and add variety throughout the ship. NPCs will now carry a more diverse range of items, too. Trolley posh pushing and cargo handling animations were refined for added realism. While the security officer outside the bridge salutes players as they walk by. That's a nice little touch. AI features. Last month, the AI feature team progressed with two key fight fights, fights, okay, and continued to improve combat animations for FPS encounters. Hit reactions were also enabled for NPCs. 
The team also expanded the movement system to allow NPCs to use ad hoc animations to enter cover, lo uh, cover locations without passing through dynamically created paths. They also continued to support other Squad 42 teams by investigating and fixing various bugs. AI Tech During February, AI Tech focused on a variety of improvements. For NPCs using trolleys, focus was on, uh, on exact positioning of trolleys in the environment. Now an NPC can correctly push a trolley to a location with an arbitrary orientation. The team also improved transit and elevator usage while pushing trolleys, so the overall flow is more robust and fluid. They've been doing this a lot. This has been like over a year of them working on AIs and trolleys. Spaceship behaviors were also iterated on to deliver better ship to turret versus turret combat. Fighters will now correctly target standalone turrets and perform appropriate combat behaviors. I believe this is all just copy pasted from the Star Citizen monthly report because this is like the, the underlying tech that runs both games. Numerous updates were added to the Apollo tool, such as improved feedback for errors in missions. The team also increased usability when navigating between mission callbacks, allowing for designers to jump to the appropriate logic for multiple elements of the interface. A new UI for subsumption tool is underway too. Specifically for Squad 42, AI Tech focused on support and bug fixes across the project. For example, they fixed the calculation that animations were used when NPCs enter cover to ensure they're facing their target. They also fixed an issue with ship operator seats causing the AI thinking, caused by the AI thinking that only a specific animation was available when exiting. Art Weapons February saw the weapons team improving wear maps across all FPS weapons. They also redesigned iron sights alongside the screen size for de uh, dedicated tools for multi-tools. The bearing a P4 AR rifle was reworked. That's an iconic weapon. Okay. Are we, we going to get away from the Space G36? Uh, and various improvements were made to the fire extinguisher too. Hmm. Hopefully the P4 AR starts to look more like a Maybe a chunkier version of the P8, but we'll see. Gameplay Story Gameplay Story began February updating a number of scenes in Chapter 16 with a newly standardized helmet setup. It felt great to see these scenes finished off and to set, see the helmet uh, animating nicely as the characters put it on. Gameplay Story Team The team also began receiving new facial animations and mastered audio, allowing them to complete several existing scenes. Alongside this, new motion capture enabled significant updates to the range of scenes. For example, a two-person scene in Chapter 4 was reshot to account for a new location and start poses, significantly improving the overall scene. Polish was done for Chapter 1, and a small but significant update was made to, cast, uh, to the cast in Chapter 14. Graphics and VFX Programming so this is going to be a lot of technical uh, uh, jargon. So if you know any of these things, please let me know in the comments below um, what it's being said. I am not an engineer. <laughs> I, I simply read the things. I have smooth brain. So uh, throughout February, the graphics team progressed with their longer term tasks. For example, work is nearing completion on unification of gas cloud and planet cloud upscaling. Those challenges caused by animated lights in gas clouds need to be solved. The gas cloud occlusion effect is also nearing completion, which will increase the, de the detail level of all gas clouds, even in flat lit scenarios. The team also resolved a long standing issue that caused a harsh line to appear when 600 meters from the gas cloud blends with the near fog system. Global Illumination team continue to work on, several, uh, work on a system to approximate complex materials within a ray traced view of the world. Last month, they began looking into performance improvements before tackling some of the more complex issues like moving objects and zones. Devs from the Water Strike team closed out the issues that came up with their final review alongside several new features, including SDF interaction for accurate collisions when vehicles hit water and an improved water intersection shader. The rest of the graphics team focused on improving and upscaling tech. This involves finalizing the new mesh format that gives major performance improvements. Mesh format? I don't know what that is. Level design. The social narrative team. Okay, I have to explain this a little bit. For those of you who don't know, there's really three teams, and I think they've they've changed this since since they now have strike teams for, for a squadron. But originally Star Citizen or Star Citizen, Squad 42 was built around three separate teams: the social, the FPS, and the dogfight team. 
And uh, so maybe the social team still exists, or maybe it's just a, a different strike team now. The social narrative team continued to work on their focus chapters, the majority of which are Idris interstitials. February's work in, uh, involved making sure the chapter can play out from start to finish, and that all narrative and scene content is presented and correct. For those who don't know what interstitials is, it's the stuff inside and in between story elements. So probably things like when you're walking from your bunk to uh, a briefing room, that's an interstitial. That's the stuff in between. For example, ensuring that medical flow is working, objectives and markers are in place, emails are set up, ship chat room content is pre present, mission brief text is updated, and landing and takeoff sequences are correct. I had to sneeze, and I didn't, so I'm going to sneeze here in a moment. <laughs> Outside of interstitials, feedback was addressed and polishing was done for Chapter 1 and, for and the Fortune Cross and Shubin Archon locations. Fortune's Cross is a station inside of... Oh, what is it? Uh, Odin. We've actually seen a little bit of the interiors of it. It's kind of like a rundown station. Narrative. The narrative team continued to close out Squadron 42's remaining next uh, text needs. This including, pr included providing chatter for some of the background environments, creating Moby Glass content, writing content for cinematics, and continuing to create other opportunities for environmental storytelling to enrich locations and provide a sense of history. As mentioned in last month's report, the team continued to work with the gameplay and design teams to polish the Galactopedia experience, solidifying the approach for when and how articles unlock. The existing entries were also passed along to the localization team to start translating. We get in the Codex, the Mass Effect Codex in Squadron 42. Without spoiling anything, the team kept working closely with an artist to create some exciting content. The team also developed some lore for another set of collectibles that will require art as well. No spoilers. Narrative team. But I like spoilers. Finally, Narrative continued to review the latest levels via playthrough and video to see if scenes are triggering as intended alongside polishing the overall narrative experience. Mesh format is they have something like the GIFs used to make up the world are formatted correctly. How they put it all together, I hope that explains it. Okay, that's still a little confusing, but thank you for, the try for trying. <laughs> We're almost done here. In February, the R&D team continued to work on the temporal render mode. History filtering has switched to a custom bicubic filter to avoid diffusion and resampling blur due to repeated history lookups. Care was also taken to eliminate potential ringing artifacts during strong camera movements. The temporal filtering of uh, transmittance was improved to avoid glowing thin silhouettes around objects and foregrounds with clouds and sun behind them. Various improvements were made to preserve history details as long as it's possible. Slow movement, no significant cloud dis 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 disocclusion, etc. And to quickly converge to a full resolution image in case history needs to be rejected. We never reject history here. <laughs> Tech animation. Last month, Tech Animation focused on refining head assets and cleaning up technical debt around their implementation. This comes as a precursor to polishing head assets and refining eye alignment to the editor to ensure characters look as good as possible. Further to this, a lar large contingent of, de of the department is working on assets set up for lockers. These will allow players and NPCs to change their apparel to something more appropriate for their current priorities. This is a Star Citizen mostly. This, this sounds simple, but in practice, we have to support a wide array of assets that can be stowed and recovered from these vessels. It can take quite, a, some, quite some time to ensure everything is set up correctly. Tech art slash animation team. The team also kicked off initiatives to ensure the health of the build remains stable and triage technical debt de de built up over the course of the project. So, if I remember correctly, Squadron 42 and Star Citizen are part of the same build. The dev build that they have is both Squadron and Star Citizen. And Squadron is run separately from Star Citizen, but they're part of the same branch. As we get towards content complete, I imagine Squadron will branch off into its own unique game, 
so it won't be sharing as much of the updates from Star Citizen, but we'll see. So you'll still see a lot of Star Citizen updates in some of these uh, Squadron 42 specific ones. The UI team worked closely with the environment and cinematics team last month, creating several pieces of movie style UI that appear during cutscenes. They also created scenes around the game levels to help with storytelling and atmosphere. Design work was done to help improve EVA and AR markers too. VFX. Last month, as well as the uh, usual art, cinematics, and design support, the VFX team support, uh, focused on polishing and optimizing an effects-intensive in-game scenario. As part of this, the artists began looking at areas where they can create bespoke explosion texture sequences to create a more cinematic, high-fidelity experience for the player. But yeah, that also it also might see in Squadron 42 with like forced civvy outfits where you're wearing... Uh, you know, a uniform or non-armor and kind of stuff like that. Who knows? Um, pretty light month. I think the biggest standout is the um, Galactopedia in-game and kind of finishing up. As well as a lot of the kind of polishing for um, the, the in-between stuff for like levels. Um, and other kind of, you know, they're definitely in the stage where they're kind of tuning in each aspects of the game feels like the, the framework is finished. It's just more of uh, making sure it all flows together naturally and makes sense. So pretty good. Um, a lot of AI contents for social features. The P4 AR is being reworked. Um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you for watching. Um, I want to hear your thoughts on this and any other topics in the comments below. Uh, if you want me to keep me, do you need to keep doing these? Um, as we get to go through Squadron, as Squadron gets closer to release, I do want to know those as well, because uh, I do want to keep following Squadron's development and keep you updated on its loot news, lore, and more as we go continue forward. Uh, let me know in the comments below, and like I say every time, hope to see you someday in the black. Hey, Paul, the latest FPS video had a few shots of the new P4 stuck in there if you look closely. Do you have uh, screenshots or anything I can see? I hope in Star Citizen they force you to change when you get to a space station, making clothing more needed. That's actually what they're going to do. If you're going to go through, because like if you land at a location where you have to go buy and sell stuff, they're going to make you go through security. And if they make you go through security, you're not going to be walking around like you're about to assault uh, Mordor. They're not going to let you walk in with heavy armor and, like, like machine guns strapped to your back. You're going to have to put that stuff away. Then, again, it's going to also differentiate. So if you're further away from civilization in places like Pyro, those stations probably won't have as much security. So you won't be, like, as policed. So do you have a clothing satchel bag or something? We don't know yet. Um... But uh, there'll definitely be places where you have to store your armor and stuff like that. I almost, I really hope we get civilian bags, like backpacks and stuff like that for that you can wear, or satchels. That would make sense. Um, because you probably, especially for things like infiltration missions, you probably want to, like, be able to have civilian clothing, because you don't want to have to, like, wear clothing all the time, so. Your ship was probably, yeah, your ship is going to have closets and storage facilities, so. But like almost certainly when you go in, like they'll make you take your armor off and you put your weapons away in the closet or in the, like the locker. So you can walk around in your undersuit, but you're going to look kind of weird. So 
Yeah, I, I would be okay with um, having access to sets and those sorts of things. Spaceship. Take away my space suit. suit. You can even take away my space lasers. No pew pews. But you can never. Never. Ever. Take away my space game. Why is it so... Cisiano just resubscribed for 10 months. You. Hey, thank you so much, Susano, for that uh, 10 months of support. You're very important. Pumper, very impressive. Is there any pedestrian? This, this is your fault. You're the reason why I'm drinking that. Shots and cheers in chat, y'all. Shots and cheers. So I, I was planning on doing Helldivers tomorrow, but we may actually be doing Star Citizen tomorrow because um, secret to top secret stuff. Keep it under your hats. Was that quiet? Uh, it may have been a little quiet. I did turn it down a little bit, so. Shop the thing incoming. We'll be able to wear our backpacks in the front then. I don't know. It totally you. He totally didn't notice and uh, try it. Try on the fly. Just just it on impulse. <laughs> But we'll see. I'll, I'll keep you updated on that one. We're definitely going to be doing some um, Star Citizen content on Sunday. And I will be not releasing a new video on Saturday. I, I will be releasing one of these on Saturday. But F Okay, so 4.15. Let's see if I can find that. At first glance, Star Citizen is a So with repooling, the idea being that if you've got lots of, let's say, if you take a 30 mag, uh, ballistic magazine, let's say you've got fifteen, 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 you've got three half empty magazines. The idea being is you just hit a key binding, the animation will That's a P4? That's a P8. It's not a P4, it's a P8. Unless they've changed the design of the P8. Play like a rummage and basically this. That might be the P4. Mag, uh, ballistic magazine. Let's say you've got 15, 15, 15, you've got three. That is a P4. Oh. That's interesting. Yeah, it looks more like the P8 now. It's a lot better, I think. Yeah, it's a lot more. Yeah. 
What do you think, chat? Yeah, he also kind of hovers over it, so it's definitely P4. Is that mine with the bearing brand now? What do you think of it as a sign as a weapon, though? Take a look at it. Because I'm, I'm looking at it really, like, there's a lot of greebles on it, which is, you know, obvious because it's a sci-fi weapon. There's some stamped metal on it. The sight looks off, but that may just be... This looks they're definitely collapsible, so it's like uh like a rail system up there. Uh I don't know everything else though. The bolt looks okay. That seems a little awkward of a bolt though, isn't it? Maybe I'm wrong. You don't usually have the bolt on the side of that you usually fire at, right? It's usually on the No, it might be on this this one. Yeah, it definitely looks more like a scar, which is what the uh, P8 looks like, so Bearing weapons are supposed to be completely modular. Uh, yeah, it was the original idea for the P8, but uh, I think they dropped that idea. Charging handle, thank you. Uh. You're a huge bearing fanboy. All the weapons are, are poo most of the time, anyhow. Just use the P6 and done. Ah, yes. You call you call a, a charging handle a, a bolt, and uh, suddenly you uh, you don't know anything. <laughs> I love I love gun nuts for that sort of thing. Should I start calling magazines clips? I'm gonna start doing that intentionally. Look at that clip of uh, of ammo there. Give me the fucking paragraph in your comment section. <laughs> My shotgun needs more bullets. Yes. Yeah, this definitely looks like it was a bullpup. Like that's what I almost I almost like uh, like like looking at this design I thought it was a bullpup at first because of like the the lines on it it's like it it looks what's the weapon that used to be the mainline British weapon the the famous one that was bullpup the og. Is the L eighty six is what I'm thinking about? Yeah. Was it was was uh, L eighty six an AUG? Was it Australia? I thought I thought the L eighty six was a uh, was a uh, was a British weapon. Yeah. <laughs> Just take the choke out, uh, and shotgun can hold more shells if you don't need scan because of legal mod. S850, L85, L86, yeah. They're all bullpup, okay, yeah. yeah that's where the, the lines remind me of that, of the of the L86. The, or the AUG, yeah. I think the AUG is a similar one. I know people there's a there's a there is a dedicated fan base for bull pups, which I never understand. That that just it just looks and feels awkward to deal with bull pups. Three half empty magazines. The idea being is you just hit a key binding, the animation will play like a rummage, and basically those magazines will condense down into full magazines and then automatically discard the empty ones. As a result of this process, you will save your precious suit item. P90 is wonderful. It's stupid and wonderful. <laughs> I 
I find I, I find the development of guns to be very fascinating. I don't know a lot of the technical jargon. I own a, a firearm. I own a shotgun, but I I, I don't use it a lot. Um, but the um, the technical jargon, not technical jargon. The the history and the development of firearms is a fascinating subject to me because there's so many. Like the the best way of describing this is that every single gun nut has their own favorite weapon. And it's going to be a very weird weapon. Um, but the thing about guns is that guns are just like any other weapon that has ever been developed by humanity. It's designed to do one thing very, very well. And that's it. They're not designed to be one size fits all. Every time someone tries to design a one size fits all weapon, it fails or is not as good as you think. The closest I would say in history is the AK platform. The AK platform has been iterated on multiple times because the 47 was not the pinnacle of all gun design, contrary to what people may, may tell you to do. The reason why the AK 47 was good is because it's easy to maintain. It's impossible to fucking break. Um, it's made out of goddamn like, like hardened steel, if I remember correctly, stamped steel. It's super cheap and easy to manufacture and an idiot can fire it. So it's it's like it's idiot proof. It's an idiot proof firearm. You could leave it out in the snow uh, and let it rust, and then kick the, the the charging handle open, and it would fire. Maybe not fire well, but it'd fire. Whereas any other weapon would just be impossible to fire. Guns are man jewelry. Yeah. That's why fire teams have different platforms with a team. Each weapon's platform needs to be specialized. It's the reason why, generally speaking, when you see most military um, or police forces that use heavy firearms, almost all the team members have special specializations because they're good for different things. It's why the Marines in insist on having a squad automatic gun, or is it the Mar Army? I can't remember which one has a squad automatic, uh, a squad automatic weapon. Um, There are good generic weapons, but they're not good in 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 serious situations. They're not going to be helpful. Reliability is arguably the most important feature in a gun that's used by soldiers in harsh environments. Yeah, because um, maintenance is is not a very easy thing to do in the, in the field, stripping and maintaining. Because that's what a lot of people people don't realize is that weapons are like they're machines. Guns are machines. They require uh, lubrication. They require maintenance and cleaning. Uh, they require everything your your car goes through on a, in terms of regular maintenance you need to do for your weapon. And if, the more you, you use it, the more it requires maintenance. Oh yeah, the, what's the rule of the bullpup? Is that if the magazine is behind the receiver? Or is it behind the... the what, I can't remember the name of it. Like it's it's like the the magazine has to be behind another part of the gun for it to be a bullpup. It's not trigger. Is it behind the trigger? It's a very temperamental tool that may explode and kill you. Yes. Yeah, action behind the trigger. Yeah, action behind the trigger. That's, that's what I remember. I remember. I remember hearing the term because people used to joke about like there, there's memes online of like what is a um, what is a bullpup and what isn't, and so people will make make ridiculous shit. Like 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 a like an Abrams is a is a bullpup. <laughs> Yeah, like with anything, the real or the real weapon of gun is just a tool. Um, but it's fascinating because, like, it, like, hold on. I 
have it ready. Also been reading this. Looking to find old uh, Renaissance and early modern European training manuals for like f fire arts, ar arts, and those kind of things as well. Because I did that originally for a story I was writing, I, I got those so I could like kind of read through and try to get an idea of how people trained and those sorts of ideas. Um, but I'm, always, I'm a historian, so like all this kind of stuff is neat. But I'm excited for Star Citizen's weapons to start actually me being more to to sort sort of merge with that idea. Like this is going to sound weird, but I really hope that Star Citizen, ha as a as a game, uh, starts to have penetration matter. And yes, I said penetration. But like, for instance, if someone, if you're going up against somebody in heavy armor and you have a P4, you shouldn't be able to do damn shit to them. Your bullets should just be ricocheting or just not penetrating. They should be able to soak it in. So if you want to deal with somebody in heavy armor, you need to have a heavy weapon. You know, something that like a shotgun with a, with a, with a slug, uh, with a solid slug rather than a, you know, birdshot or anything like that. <laughs> Yeah, like a coda. You know, like a coda should be used to take down somebody in heavy armor. Whereas, like, a P4 can take down almost anything. And now that sounds terrible to your average uh, kind of sim fan, because you're like, what, what, what? But the answer is, today, nobody wears fucking armor. <laughs> Soldiers will actively strip their armor from their own, their own uh, kit because it's just too fucking heavy. The protection you get isn't worth the weight that you have to carry around to use it. And that's one of the reasons why in sim language, you like people die in like one or two hits in most of those sort of sim, sim combat games because armor isn't really designed to, to do anything but s like slow down the bullet. But in a video game, and in the universe of Star Citizen, heavy armor should be fucking meaningful. Because it's it's not, to give you context, the, the armor of Star Citizen, especially the heavier armor, is powered. It has a, uh, it's like an exoskeleton. It's a mini exoskeleton. So, while you sh obviously shouldn't be able to be sprinting in that thing, it should give you, you know, more of a, you should still be able to move around with, uh, mostly unencumbered. F7 Mark II, not Mark III. Is that Maelstrom? I asked because CIG's whole stick top down, bottom approach, go swoosh. Or, uh, uh <laughs> approach to systems. Uh, yeah, I think, I think that would, Maelstrom would probably uh, pay into that because it's a material system thing. Yeah, they're removing deflection, which is great. But the armor needs to be able to, su to survive on its own. The M. CERN Marines. I don't know if I've heard of that. Look it up. Yes, I am ready for it. Sorry, X. I kept saying you, you, uh. 
you you kept talk, speaking when I was doing uh, office hours stuff or uh, capsule stuff. Yeah, that's what always always fascinates me about weapons development is that weapons development is always seen as like an arms race between armor and weapons. But the reality is, is that if we want to, we could make a fully bulletproof suit. But you'd look ridiculous and you'd be able to have no situational awareness or movement. And in a modern battlefield, movement is life. In a modern combat situation, movement is life. So being nimble and being able to move fast and move away from your enemy or, you know, re-engage or whatever you need to do is more important. It'll be exactly like the F8, yeah. The F7, F7 Mark II. Uh, I think it'll, it'll probably be purchasable, not only. Oh, the Martian Colonial uh, Congressional Republic, Republic Navy. Yeah, yeah, the, the their their um, exoskeleton suits. Those, that's what should, that's what the. Um, their, their 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 armor should be their power armor should be what uh what the heavy suits are because the heavy suits are power armor. I don't think you're going to be able to see the F eight A F seven A turret. I don't think you're you're not getting the F seven A. You're going to need the F seven C Mark two. So it's the F seven. C, but in a different style. This stupid question, how long before Captain's Table did you want to do the t uh, the, the tier list show? This man is asking for the time and I can't find the time listed. Um, so the time is usually around 3 p.m. Uh, Central Time, 3.30 p.m. Central Time. So I can do it earlier in the mornings. if Because uh, I figured we'd be doing it early in the morning anyway, it's my time because that's usually what's okay with, uh, with um, Space Tomato. Have we, have we all stopped talking about building bases? Building bases isn't coming for a while now, but hopefully. Uh, no, it would be 3.30 p.m. my time. 3.30 central. But uh, noon my time would be fine. Are you, are you talking about like like the tearless show? Yeah, th uh, noon my time would be fine. That's three and a half hours before. But I can do earlier if you need me to. What's up with nanotech in game? I don't know a lot about nanotech in Star Citizen's lore. Um, there is, it does exist, and I know it's part of how the healing systems work. Because like, one of the ways, the ways that the um, the the healing the healing beams work is they're not actually healing beams. They're uh, they're they're uh, they're they're small specialized um, tractor beams. Yeah, the streams of nanites. So, like, the tractor beam, like, the, the, the device itself is shooting a tractor beam which has nanites that are traveling along in it into your bloodstream. Where was it confirmed, Buck? Hey, piss poor peep. We are the Borg. Lower your shields and surrender your ships. I need to heal you. Wowee. <laughs> no, there wouldn't be a lot of army nanotech. The, the general rule of thumb is if you're dealing with anything that is overpowered, then um, CIG will, like the lore, will, will write it away. realize you're having fast card on again ready 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 for the end of your channel uh we're gonna have a very in-depth discussion that's gonna piss off a lot of people so it might be the end of my channel 
We're going to talk about inclusion in this environment, which is uh, dangerous. <laughs> I'm joking around. I didn't realize it was uh, way earlier in your stream when you, when you said you keep it on your hat about a secret business tomorrow. It's, um... Fuck, what is it called? It's uh, Stella Fortuna, isn't it? Aren't they doing something for Stella Fortuna? Do I think May is realistic time frame for 3.23 patch? It's going to be in April, if I remember correctly. <laughs> Only if you get upset with a Death Trooper. <laughs> They can have the same sh uh, technology they have on ship for shields on armors. They can't, no, because they don't have a small enough. Um, there's not a small enough uh, power supply. The power supplies that run most of the shields in Star Citizen is still the size of like a car battery. <laughs> But yeah, no, I, I think there's still, unless unless I skipped over that in the monthly report, I think they, uh, 3.23 is supposed to come out in April, isn't it? Unless they said it was coming out in May. Led from the chairman. Look it again. I'm looking forward to getting your hands on Star Citizen Alpha 3.23 soon, where you will uh, finally be able to experience many features we're having hard, uh, we've been hard at work the past couple of years, which will then lead to the Invictus launch week in May. So it sounds like they're going to have a 3.23 in April, which is what they were still shooting for, with a 3.23.1 for Invictus. Have they updated the lore in regards to the mysterious faction of that Vandal are afraid of? Nothing yet so far, no. CIG tends to not have an Invictus patch be a dot zero or dot X patch or three dot X patch. They tend to have a three dot whatever the X dot X patch, like a dot one or dot two, because they like to release the, the patches first and then fix them because Invictus is a big sale and they want it to be as stable as possible. One p.m. my time. That's fine. That's uh, so two p.m. Eastern. F seven C Mark two. Don't they usually do something like a treasure hunt or something like that for for um, for Stella Fortuna? Or am I mixing that up with uh, the 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 Lunar New Year stuff. I remember there was like something you had to go like look for. Will the patch be on time? Uh, we'll see. Patches are like wizards. <laughs> they arrive precisely when they need to. Uh, except last year was 319, but that was, yeah, that was 318.3. That's that's a stable, it was a stable patch comparatively. Still bad, but stabler, more stable. I want green, I do, I also want green beer for Stella for Stella Fortuna. That's one of those things that I'm looking forward to.
<laughs> stable or star citizen? Ha, ah, star citizen is as stable as a boulder on a cliff being picked up by a rabid chicken. It's as stable as, uh, as execute is uh, after a night of drinking. <laughs> I'd really hope that if we the new CDF stuff that's coming up, the um, the the new Xeno Threat preview stuff that they've mentioned in the past, uh, I really hope that it has also more like cosmetic stuff too, because like the CDF armor that I have is some of my most prized possessions <laughs> in game. So. <laughs> Good boy, the bestest boy. Don't lie, don't lie, PD boy. <laughs> don't lie. As stable as CR's hands are, and he talks about dog fighting. <laughs> Bye, Americans. You know, St. Patrick's Day is not nearly as a big thing in Dublin as it is in Chicago. Yeah. I know. <laughs> it's more of an American holiday than anything else, which is fine. It's just like, you know, uh, a lot of American holidays, they tend to be bigger in America than they are other places. Oh, uh, lockable ships and cosmetics and weapons, etc. is a great idea. My favorite. I think it's the future. It's how CIG is going to uh, manage and balance um, the components. It's just how the best way to do it. Forces players to interact with the universe around them. Actually pay attention to the factions they're fo fo focusing on. So you want to get the best gear, you got to work for the right factions. Otherwise, you're fucked. <laughs> Because reputation isn't, uh, this isn't a Bethesda game. You can't be the leader of the Thieves Guild, the Dark Brotherhood, the Fighters Guild, um, the Mages Guild, and everything else. Like, you you, 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 you choose to be the, uh, the leader of the Thieves Guild, your ass is banned from every other guild. And that's what's how it's going to work in Star Citizen. What do you think they'll start releasing cosmetic ship body modification kits? I think this, I mean, after the letter from the chairman, I think that's the, that's a step. That's one of those abandoned projects that CAG needs to get back to. That and ship naming. I think that's the same, along the same lines, so. We may be better at drinking, but Scotland still kicks our, 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 our their own ass better than we kick ours. <laughs> Damn Scots ruined Scotland. <laughs> uh, Lollipop Guild Spirit as a hardcore guild, Leroy. That's a it's a hell of a guild to to, to try to get into. I'll have faith in CIG, but if they start naming things sensibly, that's what I'll be concerned. <laughs> Never change CIG. I just want to see all the backlog ships released and the old ones brought up to the gold standard before all the other secondary sh uh, ship co uh, implementation cut slash cosmetics. 
I disagree. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why you'd want to focus on the cosmetic stuff uh, before you bring everything up to, up to standards. Because um, there's no point in bringing something up to standards if you then have to, com to completely develop a brand new system that you then have to go back and work on that ship again to bring it up to standards again after you've developed the system. Because it won't work without you having that baseline. So having a baseline that you can pull it from, so like, oh, we need, this is part of that gold standard now to get it up to this customization standard. That makes sense. Having the goals laid out for all the ships to do so. Quanta quantum jump, jumping when? Quanta quantum jumping through a jump point. What's wrong with the F7C and Mark II? I don't know. I don't know what the F7C and Mark II is. It's just been one of those things that's been in the, the files for a while, the F7C Mark II version. No, I, I get the Lollipop Guild joke. I got the joke. <laughs> Well, I'll admit, I was presupposing that they would actually decide on how shit flew and resources worked first. That stuff's going to have to be put in there anyways. A lot of stuff they have ideas about, but like, the thing is, is that having an idea of how you make customization, like customized, like colors for ships or even ship naming is one thing, but actually implementing it and going through and building it out is another because a lot of that is also going to be social engineering, which you can't code for. <laughs> yeah, the Lollipop Guild requires you to know by heart the difference between Magnus Lollipops and Stanton and Terra Lollipops. <laughs> Uh, I don't think they'll they'll give us uh, Mark II gladiators and retaliators because the Mark II was created specifically for Squadron, um, like well after they started uh, development of uh, of Squadron Forty Two. Like it's it's much more focused on that. Uh, Paul, do we know if crime stats will restrict uh, you from getting through or into a jump point? Uh, probably not restrict your access to a jump point, but you might get shot at. All you need to get through a jump point is a jump, uh, jump, uh, drive. So we don't like, we don't have gates necessarily that we know of. Like Pyro doesn't have a physical gate. We don't know what the gates, we do know that CIG has been toying around with the idea of using gates, but we know that like Pyro and Stanton don't have a gate. They have just a, a wormhole, a, a jump point. Have a good night there. Well, there is going to be some lead up time, likely. Uh, if we, if you take the, uh, the 2019 kind of proof of concept that they showed off to everybody, um, you're gonna be sitting at a jump gate, activating it with your jump drive. It'd probably take you a few minutes, so you can't just bum rush it. You'll have to get there and activate it and then go through it. You know, the process of opening it up and stabilizing it and then going through it. Uh, they might do a Connie Mark II, but it'll probably not be a Mark II. It'll probably be a Connie 29 whatever version, because Connie is actually on Mark, Mark IV right now. It's, yeah, it's it's on like Mark IV, Mark V, so it would be the Connie Mark VI. We'll sadly never see Gladiator Mark II because it'll require CIG to remember it exists. I remember, Shinobi. I remember. It is the ship with the coolest fucking lore in Star Citizen. It has the most in-depth lore. We know everything about that fucking ship. We know everything there is to know. And CIG just abandoned that bitch. <laughs> Mark 7. Yeah, I think it's Mark 7.
literally was designed as a scam. <laughs> uh. Right. I'm going to call it a night, y'all. Thank you for hanging out with us here tonight at the Astro Pub. I had a great time. This is fantastic. This was fun. Uh, I will edit and upload that video. Probably out tomorrow at brand new. Those of you who missed the, um, the, the monthly report stuff or the, the other stuff, so keep your eyes on the prize for that or the letter from the chairman. That's what we did. Uh, and then uh, yeah, I'll be back on around one my time, so 2 p.m. Eastern uh, with uh, Loken. Uh, we'll probably do some hell divers. We might do some of the stuff. We'll see. Anyway, thank you for hanging out with us. Love your faces. Um, thank you, Abdi. This is a 48 hour stream. No. <laughs> thank you for watching. Love your faces. And uh, like I say every time, I hope to see you someday in the black. <laughs>